the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story. And this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. What's up, everyone? Here we are on the My Backstory podcast, episode number 17 with Tony Blauer. It's crazy, man. I uh, <laughs> you reach out to people you never expect that you know. You, I, at least I don't. I don't expect like, hey, I don't know if this person can get back to me or if we're going to end up being able to make this happen. But I was super excited that I uh, was able to connect with Tony because I think that we're going to have a. You guys are going to hear a lot of really cool stuff hearing his backstory. Hopefully, I can share a little bit of mine during this story or during our conversation, um, and we can talk about mindset, you know, and how it all plays into uh, having courage, how it plays into overcoming obstacles, and how it comes comes playing to overcoming fear. So I'm going to give it over to Tony and let him share his story with you. Thanks, man. Hey, yeah. this is this is exciting, and it was, uh, you know, it's funny. It always kind of blows my mind when I think customer service and and just being polite and respectful <laughs> has fucking disappeared oh, yeah. on the planet. And and uh, like I get that response a lot. Oh, thank you for answering the email. Like, like, thank you for returning my call. Like, like, what else was I supposed to do? Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's, I mean, sometimes you get something where, where I, like I got hit up a private message on, um, it was Instagram, where, hey, how are you? And I'm like, good, thanks. And then it was like, and then the guy was trying to sell me something. Right. And then I didn't answer for like a minute because like, 60 seconds of life interfered from my Instagram. Yeah. And then he sends like a question mark. So I'm going, oh, you're a dick, like delete, block, right? <laughs> right. But in general, like, why aren't we nice to each other? That's a trip. It really is. You, you know, know, I was talking to my sister about that actually, how she tells her kids, like, if you just respond to an email, if you just answer your phone at work, you will be a superstar. Right. Because most people just aren't doing the basics anymore. You know, there's no communication anymore. It's bizarre, right? Yeah, yeah it's super bizarre. It's but bizarre. I, I really appreciate you getting back to me. I really do. Because like I said, I think the content that we're going to talk about is going to resonate with a lot of people across all, all it's, kinds of walks of life. It's, it's huge. And I think that the most important stuff that I do isn't the stuff that I do that people think I do, right? right. So people like, I think, put me in a box of, oh, he's a martial artist, or he's a knuckle dragger, or he's a, a fitness slash combatives, you know? And my relationship with fear, in fact, I just, uh, I was texting one of the, I got a whole, I'm like this old, old, old race car, and I've got lots of people who work on me all the time. Yeah. I'm just broken in so many places, because of, you know, like, athletes today or they're they're tactical athletes you know in the military law enforcement or crossfitters or whoever you're in the golden age of mobility stability prehab right like yeah. all of that stuff absolutely the, the, you know when in the 80s we, we would warm up by punching each other really hard right let's go let's go light let's start you know your warm-up was while well, you put on gloves and your i mean it was you didn't have a 45 minute like a rolling out session, right? Right. So um, I don't, and some days, and you can relate to this, some days the, my threshold for pain is insane. And there are days when I've got tears in my eyes yeah. where, where uh, knock on wood, uh, it's it's been uh, months that I found the right team. I've got three or four different people that, that work on me. Right. Every, everything from, uh, you know, fucking chiropractor to deep tissue to cranial to my whatever i just and i'm always looking for and i discovered something that you discovered is that a lot of it is just neuroplasticity a lot of it is just how you talk to yourself and and uh, there's such a big difference between saying when will this stop versus a more meditative thing like okay you're dealing with this you're okay this is better than you like it's just that positivity and just yeah. and just ch and just changing it uh, you know, we can, it's a beautiful sunny day here uh, in Southern California, but we can look outside and I go, look at that fucking cloud, right? right? And then I could, if I talk long enough about the cloud, 
and someone asked me how the weather is it's like it's shit right <laughs> yeah, totally. so a lot of it in life is is what we choose to focus on absolutely you know i had a guru that uh he's actually my um my wife's uncle and uh he's like a zen master you know so when i was recovering from this last surgery he would call me every day he's metaphorically him. a zen master or literally he's like zen he's he's he's, a... he's into zen like okay. big time okay, i don't cool. i don't yeah, yeah so yeah. and he's 80 uh, i think he's like 89 or right. something like that anyway so uh he would call me every day and just ask me you know where where i was you know how you doing i was like i'm all right and they, so he would go through this meditation with me about controlling the course of my mind. Nice. And uh, so that's really how I got through the whole recovery was like I would just quiet my mind and let my body do whatever I was going to do, heal and do whatever. And and I just got through it. And I would take it like in increments of like sometimes it was one minute, sometimes it was five. But before I knew it, I was like, all right, cool. I got through the night. I'm good. You know? Yeah. And I lived to fight another day. Why don't you... Uh, this is your interview and you're interview, interviewing me, but I'm going to interview you. Yeah. Why don't you, without getting too graphic, because because I'm a queasy like that, right. and for new people as your as your uh, podcast gets traction and hopefully it, it grows, people look back. Yeah. Uh, you shared just before we started talking, is getting to know you, just like some of that that insight, the, the, what was the genesis of, you had obviously some back injuries and then, Right. Take it from there. So I had um, my sixth back surgery was in June of last year. And um, I knew then that like I didn't want to go down the road of being on opiates and uh, other pain pills. And because I had gone down that road, I was a, a huge addict with uh, every opiate you could think of anti anxiety pills, uh, sleeping pills, you name it, I was taking them. Because the injuries are pre. Yeah. So I've, I had five. So I started in the military. My back was all jacked up. I didn't know the, the extent of that injury. So I just kept abusing my body, abusing my body. I was lifting, I was working. Um, just, I didn't know like what was wrong until I had an MRI and then I had an MRI. They're like, yeah, you have four herniated, completely herniated discs. So, like there's no way to even fix these. Um, I was like, okay, uh, what do I need to do? And they're like, well, you need to have surgery. You know, so like a young, typical young guys, you know, told them to fuck off. And I just kept doing what I was doing until I couldn't walk anymore really. Um, so like every year it seemed like I had another surgery. I'd have surgery, then my back would give out again, have another surgery. Huh. And I would never stop. I just kept going, kept going. But while during that time I'm taking, you know, I go from just taking simple Norcos, you know, or Vicodin, and then that graduates to like morphine sulfate. Then that graduates to, you know, more morphine and then a fentanyl patch on top of that. And next thing you know, I mean, you're taking a copious amount of drugs and right. just to feel normal, quote unquote normal, you know? And that became my new normal. And so I, you know, had really bad anxiety. I struggled with that. So I would, you know, take a Xanax. And then if the Xanax stopped working, then I would take a Clonopin. So it'd be a little bit longer acting. And I was so wound up. And I would take an Adderall to get me going, you know, during the day because I was so doped up. And then oh, I can't sleep now. So I'd pop an Ambien. I mean, I was on a cocktail, a straight roller coaster of drugs. Wow. So I quit all of those cold turkey one day. I just decided on October 8th of 2011, I was done. So um, was there something that made you go, I can't do this. I got to stop now. I think I, uh, I got a divorce and I had my son and I was looking at him one day and I was like, man, I'm not available to him at all. I'm in the same room with him, but I'm not here. How old yeah. is he now? Uh, he's 12 now. Nice. Good for you, man. Yeah. So uh, I just said, I, hey. I, I want to inject something here because yeah. it's just, it's a profound thing for dads out there. Single moms, single dads, uh, people with kids. You know, it was a, a quote that I had. Uh, I've got three kids. My son was from a previous relationship, and I got custody of him when he was three weeks old. That's awesome. And and raised him, and uh, it was really scary. I mean, you know, there's no, there's oh, yeah. even if you're in a solid relationship, there's no real manual. You right. know, like you're just you're just winging just do it. What you know. And uh, and I remember trying to read and understand, but I I, I knew I wasn't going to abandon him. And uh, there were there were two quotes that really impacted me and drove me and you made me think about it just there so i had to share it with your audience yeah. one was uh there's no such thing as illegitimate children there's yeah. only illegitimate parents right which blew my mind because it was like one of those things like who am i right. you know and then uh uh there was another one uh that uh um it was a famous actor who said uh when I look at my kid, I never want him to look back and see a liar. Right. 
and that one blew my mind. It's like, what, what's the lie we're telling ourselves? What's the lie we're telling our kids? Yep. You know, it's like why I couldn't be there for you or why why I didn't follow my dreams or why I drink or whatever. But anyways, totally. go, go, go on with Yeah, so I um, I appreciate that. So I, I, yeah, I was looking at my son same same way and being like, I need to be a better version of who I am for him, right. you know, and teach him like kind of a, I didn't have my dad around most of my life. So it was kind of like, I didn't have a, I guess a skill per se that like really teach. I wasn't an electrician. I mean, I installed elevators. I can teach some of that stuff, but I wanted something that I could leave for him. And and for me, mindset was what I wanted to impart on my son is like, I want you to like understand that like you're in charge of your own destiny, like embrace it. So yeah, I quit everything cold turkey. I was hanging out with a buddy um, named Scott and uh, Scott actually works for Stevo uh, from Jackass. Okay. So yeah, nice. yeah. so uh, Scott and I were hanging out and um, He's like, you need to get your life together, you know? So yeah, I was like, yeah, I think you're right. So I just quit everything. And um, I had three seizures, you know, from quitting everything cold turkey. Yeah. And not, uh, not the prescribed, ironically, the, the prescribed method of weaning off any right. type of serious drug. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, the doctors, my family, everyone was like, oh, you need to wean yourself off. You need to this. And my mentality just was never that way. I was like, when I wanted to be done with something, I just would wanted to sever the ties and be right. done. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a doctor and I'm not uh, recommending that anybody take that route. It's just what worked for me. Right. And um, so I did. And so when I had this last uh, back surgery, I knew they were going to give me drugs while I was in the hospital. It's just like a, you know, come on, it's a major surgery. They went through my stomach. They went through my back, had to go through an old fusion that was damaged and mess up, uh, break through that fusion and basically redo a fusion from the front and the back. So it was a 12 hour operation. And, uh, you know, I was in a lot of pain. It was it was tough. You know? I bet. Uh, so in the hospital, I took the drugs they gave me, and and that was fine. And then when I left the hospital, I had, uh, I actually uh, still carry the medication they gave me at the Cedar Sinai with the seals still on them. Huh. And people ask me like, why do you carry that with you? And I was like, because I want that constant reminder that like, I'm in charge. Nice. And um, it makes me feel like empowered, you know. And yeah. Um, so yeah, so here I am, and and I wanted to start this this podcast to share my backstory. And so I, I call it my backstory, you know? It's, it's, and, it's kind of genius. Yeah, yeah. And, then, yeah. Uh, and then hear other people's backstory. And it's kind of funny because my story is, you know, I thought like, oh, it's kind of special, whatever. But in reality, when you hear other people's story, you're like, wow, there's so many people that share, you know, either a similarity or their story is way more intense than mine. And uh, this is a great forum to share those stories. And it's kind of cool. It's, a, it's, it's cool. And, uh, I also have a bad back, but nothing, nothing, I, but nothing like that. So my 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 story, I mean, you know what? When like, there's nothing you can do when you stub your toe, mm -hmm. but when you stub your toe, fuck, that's all you're thinking about. It hurts, yeah. and you're screaming, and you're jumping around like like a like a fucking snowflake, yelling, my, you know, like. Yeah. But you just got to go through it, and yeah. it's just stubbing your toe. <laughs> it's all it's all relative. Right. So. I always throw the snowflake in there because my my uh, my wife and and one of my daughters always refer to me as a slow snowflake. <laughs> like, like they call me. The, That's hilarious. It, it's funny. I'll be around the house and I'll be like, "Oh fuck! Like, d why is the email so slow? Oh, Dad, are you gonna start crying? You're such a snowflake." <laughs> That hurt my feelings. Don't say that. See, you're a snowflake, right? Yeah, that's funny. So, yeah. yeah. So, how did you get started in the whole uh, martial arts game? Um, the what was a catalyst for that? Yeah. So it's like it's so weird. And this is like I was, I was texting one of the guys that's helping me heal, and we were just talking about self awareness and consciousness. And I said to him, like, I have always been afraid, my whole life. Uh, weird fears, uh, all like from from the kid war here. Like every like everywhere I walk, I visualize some. I'm making fun now a ninja jumping out and what I would do. Right. And I always did that. At, you know, five years old, if I could remember, seven, nine. I was afraid in every sport. Everything, anything that happens, and it's kind of freaky. Anything that happens, I immediately see the negative first. Yeah. That has great value in mission planning, but it doesn't have a lot of value if it's happening when you're just walking down the street, walking your dog, you know? Yeah. So now what you're doing is like you're expending this negative energy. And if you don't catch yourself, you're in, it's, it's like, it's like, 
it's interesting. Like last night, so I came up to LA yesterday. I had like four hours of work done. Right. Uh, I've got uh, the serious neck, facial nerve injury, back, a whole bunch of things. So I had like about four hours of work done. So, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to be more active in how I can control my sympathetic nervous system to my parasympathetic and make that shift because like I'll wake up after a good night's sleep and my body's racing like I'm being chased by a fucking tiger. Yeah. And, and I'm like, and so I don't have like anxiety, but I'm lying there and my body's buzzing and I can feel my heart's going too fast. And I'm like, I just slept for seven hours. That's fucked, right? There's just something going on. Right. Um, and uh, I forget where I was going with this. So I was, I was, oh, I was up here, you're just having the self-awareness. I was up here last night. Uh, when I do these treatments, I always get a hotel and I just chill out and, and then I slowly go home uh, the next day. Yeah. And uh, so last night I'm sitting here, order room service, and I put on, I love fucking action movies. I mean, I, I, I've i been training tier one guys for decades, uh, cops, military, all the way down to, you know, probably the only guy that's ever taught in a women's shelter. So I've had like both ends of that pendulum, yeah. like the people that run towards danger and the people who didn't know how to run from danger or do anything about it. Yeah. And I'm sitting there and I see this uh, a trailer for a really cool new Stallone Netflixy thing, and it looks like it's really well done. And there's, of course, killing and bad guys and all of that. And while I'm watching the just a two minute trailer, I say to myself, "This is going to stimulate your SNS. Right. This is what you do all the time. This is not what you should be watching." But it was having that moment where I had the self awareness to. And this might seem stupid to people listening, but this is so potent in your life is it's it's the purpose of meditation is to catch the thought that you're thinking about that somehow unsolicited popped into your head and has hijacked what you could or should be thinking about yep and i put on a fucking comedy and then laughed for two hours oh. and then read and went to bed oh. right but it was it was a cool moment that i recognized oh and so here i am 58 years old oh. and and I'm only starting to recognize like that, that in the past, whether I was 11 or 15 or 18, um, you know, the fear thought would happen. And then I would continue playing that movie in my mind. Where does this go? Where does this go? Where does this go? And next thing you know, either five minutes or five days, you know, you've been going, holy shit. And then that never happened, of course. But you rationalize it because you think you're preparing for it. Yeah. Right, so you're working out, you're shooting, you're striking, you're doing all like all your stuff, but the event never happens. You got to find that balance and recognize, uh, uh, you know, where it's it's eating up your energy and your enjoyment of your life. So fear can keep you alive, but it can also kill you slowly. Oh yeah, if you don't understand how to look at fear, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of research out there that is uh, um, not irrelevant but needs an upgrade, it needs an update. When, when, when people lecture about fear, you often hear the fight, flight, freeze talks and everyone talks about that and everyone's nodding and everything. And I remember doing a, a seminar and a guy puts up his hand and, and, and I'm talking and I, I, I start off a lot of these provocative talks and I say the physiology of fear is not important to you in the moment of danger. The only thing that's important is for you to understand the psychology of fear. What are you going to be thinking now? All right. Because if I if it's fight flight, I don't personally, and I've only been involved in some sort of wrestling, MMA, boxing, taekwondo, uh, combatives, whatever, since I'm seven. So I've right. only been doing it 51 years. Uh, <laughs> only 51. Right. Only 51. <laughs> and my point, I'm being facetious. My my. My point is that the in the moment that the danger is from immediate to imminent and you get your fear spike, the only thing that's going to get you out of there is not good and be some sort of like unconscious response. You need to somehow have some sort of prefrontal, you know, uh, activation there. I should play dead here. I'm going to hit the guy here, I'm gonna pick up this improvised weapon. People can argue this and, and, I, and I get the semantics thing, right. but the the actual definition of fight or flight is this 
this uh, 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 you know physiological limbic system, amygdala, reptilian brain response that kept our, the cavemen you know uh, alive and all yeah. that. Uh, uh, fights, battle, violence have have changed a lot since two million years ago, right? Totally. I, you know, I mean, just yesterday I saw a saber tooth tiger on Rodeo Drive. It was cr <laughs> actually it was a woman dressed in leopard print, but I thought it was a saber tiger in Iran. Um, but you know what I'm saying? It's like we don't walk around with katanas anymore. Or we don't. We're just not like, and and it, you know, it's 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 an amazing thing. It's just the reframe. And I'm not putting down the research. What I'm saying is there is a, and this is just my intuition in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, and I know I'm not answering your question, but I'll somehow get back to it. It's all good. But in the 80s, uh, I was teaching this, uh, uh, he's a, he was a professor and he was a doctor of psychiatry and he also had a, a position at this Royal Victoria Hospital up in Canada, which is very famous for their research on psychology. He also happened to be a private self-defense student of mine. And I didn't know his background, but I was training him for like a year privately. And uh, I would always take my students on this journey of, hey, the mind navigates the body. And if you didn't fear fear, what would you do? Because at the end of the day, if I said, go spar that guy, and I saw you go, and gulp, yeah. right? I tried to really do that loud so your audience could hear that. I don't <laughs> know if I came out, right? Um, uh, I'd be like, stop, what were you thinking there? Why were you visualizing yourself sucking or getting hurt or not doing well? It has, you haven't even gotten in the ring yet, yeah. right? And so I was always really into the whole mindset piece. Why? Because I grew up with performance anxiety in some sort of, and anxiety has uh, has become more mainstream, people talking about it. Yeah. And I think it turns off a lot of people. Uh, but to reframe it a little bit, I look at it as like any thought where you're like focusing on your failure or your pain or this not working out, and it's consuming your your potential to engage or move towards that is a type of anxiety. Yeah. Where a lot of people think of like, well, you know, like anxiety is the panic attack. Right. And that's, if it goes unchecked and too severe, it can obviously devolve into that. Yep. Um, so the, I'm telling like 19 stories at once. And, it's uh, all good, I like it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so here I am, I'm teaching this, this, this guy, his name was uh, Dr. Presser. I can't believe I just remembered his name. This is back in the 80s. <laughs> and... Uh, and I don't know what his background is. And then one day he says to me, um, you know, this is fascinating stuff, all your mindset stuff. Like, you know, where's it from? And I said, well, it's just like, I've just been studying violence and fear intuitively. He goes, what does that mean intuitively? That's not how you do research, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> right? you know? I said, well, I, you know, I, like I wanted to get like a couple of rabbits and a monkey and talk to them, but I couldn't speak monkey and I couldn't, I go like, I I teach people, and this is actually, you know, I've never talked about this on a podcast, so this is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, if you want to study fear, the people you need to talk to are the people that have been really afraid, right? Yeah. And then find the thread between the victim and the victor. And it's never been technique. It's never been, well, I was, uh, you know, you were doing wushu and he was doing jujitsu and that's why it didn't work out. It was it, it was always mindset. So yeah. there are jujitsu guys that lose fights because of mindset and there's jujitsu guys that win fight because of mindset. Yeah. But then everyone thinks it's the style. And then there's, you know, people who go like, and you know this from, from the tactile community, is like, you know, what kind of gun you got? It's like, like, it's never the gun. Of course, you could have like a really shit gun with really shit bullets and that would suck. Right. But uh, other than the instances where there truly was a technological malfunction, it was always the mindset, yeah. right? And uh, and I would just find these like, and uh, truthfully, I didn't know why I, would, I knew things. I would just say things. Yeah. I'd be talking and then I go, hey, careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. <sighs> And someone go, wow, who said that? I go, I, 
I just I did. said that right now. <laughs> you know, and for years it was really funny. This is so obnoxious, but I can say it, and everyone can go fuck themselves if they don't like it. Yeah. Is for years I would say, remember what Einstein said: the theory determines the experience. So if you start with the, you know, how you define something determines its usefulness to you. And for like ten years, I I would say Einstein said that. And then one of my students doing he said like Einstein never said that. He says I'm like an Einstein nut. I've been looking for that all over. I go, well, who the fuck said that? He said, you said that. Like, I was like, really? You know, I could take Einstein in a fight. I mean, it's all relative, of course. But, but, anyways, that's funny. The the uh, I hope so. I hope some of you, other people, like just like logged off the podcast. He just compared himself to Einstein. That shit was hilarious. Um, the, uh, um, but I would get into these things, and I wouldn't know why. I'd be sitting there and doing some stuff, and I go, "How do you think without the interference of thought?" How do you just fucking like just observe, right? Yeah. And uh, and so this guy, Doctor Presser, I, like I don't know. Again, one day he says to me, like the question was like, "Where did you get this?" I said, "Just like intuition, instincts." I don't know why. I just know when I say it or think it, it's right. Yeah. And it's not that I can apply it all the time. I just it's almost like I'm a conduit to something just popped into my head. It came out my mouth. Everyone went. What the fuck was that? Say that again, and then we'd whiteboard it and dissect it. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, it's like like a little thing. I was standing up in, in front of a whiteboard, and do you remember when the No Fear T-shirt company came out? Oh, yeah. Like I had every shirt, and why did I want every shirt? Because like your pills in your bag, huh. that reminded me: stop being so fucking scared. Huh. This was like decades before the word snowflake. Stop being a fucking snowflake flower, huh. right? That's for you, Olivia. If she ever, she'll never listen to this. My my daughter who calls me <laughs> stuff like, and uh, but I'd have everyone, and, I, and so in my little stand up routine when I'm doing our our you know we do seminars all over the world and we do a seminar called No Fear, and it's spelled K N O W, yeah. and uh, and part of my talk is is I say, hey, I had every No Fear T shirt. I said, but they must have all been defective because I still had my fear even when I was wearing the shirt oh. it did change my state a little bit because i put it on i go this cool logo this is the state i want to feel i want to do that but that didn't change the fear spike if a certain stimulus appeared yep right and so uh I, you know everyone would giggle when i'd say that i go so who here would like to achieve the state of no fear and i was like yeah yeah i go it doesn't exist because there's always going to be a certain stimulus that will put you out of your comfort zone. And so I have this uh, uh, three circles that, that kind of overlap. I go, this is your comfort zone, things you're cool with. Yep. And it's this big. And then just slightly outside your comfort zone, kind of like kind of like where, you know, when you're out in a lake or the ocean and you're kind of walking out and bouncing and playing mm -hmm. and you go like, oh, I'm bouncing here, but my lips are just above the water. And that next step, yep. you go under and it surprises you as a kid, but you kind of know you're safe, but you're scared. Yeah, you awesome. know, you can go take a step back, but, but you don't know what the next drop is. Well, that's your discomfort zone. Yep. And then past that is your holy shit zone, right? Yeah. And so for decades, I've been saying, we need to safely and scientifically explore our holy shit zone, not to be like the adrenaline junkie, you know, I got a death witch. I'm talking about like, like using fear as a signal to self-actualize, using fear of like, like, do I need to, I can make like a really lame things like, you know, my, um, you know, my office calls, they go, hey, we got to go over spreadsheets, accounting. And then I go, I don't do spreadsheets. Like I've decided I'm afraid of math. And it's right, <laughs> right. Uh, it can be something as stupid as that, or, you know, uh, talking to people, saying, I'm sorry, saying, I love you, uh, uh, asking for help, right? I'm, I can't do that. I'm, I don't want to be, I don't want to look weak. And um, not realizing that that fear is actually weakening you. It's not strengthening you at that point. And so it's this ir ironic, like Zen cone type thing of like, hey, fear keeps us alive. It's the fear spike that alerts you to danger. But then if you don't understand how to use fear as a signal and then use fear as a fuel, it can kill you because you yeah. didn't fucking start take action. to engage to take action. <clears throat> so, so all of this stuff, Da, 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 da. Like it's just it's just coming out of me, yeah. and and here I am on the whiteboard. This is back in the eighties or early nineties, uh, where I wrote the word no fear, and then I put a K and a W on the either side of the word no, yeah. and I said there's no such thing as no fear, but there is a way to get to no fear, 
by looking at fear differently, by looking at it as what if we looked at it as our backup, our companion right at the beginning of a fight? Because you would you rather fight alone or with a buddy? With a buddy, for sure. Of course. So a lot of times we're alone. And when you're usually when you're scared, you're alone, Yep. right? And you could be like scared in a group, like in battle. And then there's that one person that steps up and goes, let's fucking do this. And that's contagious. Yep. Courage is contagious. Perfect. And you can also practice courage, right? In yeah. in little things, because it's that mindset. It's looking at those pills and going, see how strong you are? Because if you talk to all the experts, the SMEs, they just said, don't do that. Oh yeah, totally. Right? So so that no fear reframe was huge. And in this like, you know, 30 something years, like last year I realized like, and I, I have the statement that I mean it and I stand by it. And so my vehicle to help people understand how to navigate life is through self-defense because I believe that if here we are having this deep talk, I'm yeah. sharing intimate stuff. If the door broke open and an active shooter came in here and started shooting at us, neither one of us would continue talking about the podcast. Correct. We'd be flinching, hitting the ground, looking for improvised weapons, jumping through the window, or if he's close enough, attack, charging the threat, right. right? But we'd be all reacting to the danger. And so my mantra and, and my mission and vision has always been that the ability to protect yourself or a loved one is an arguably the single most important skill you could possess. Yeah. And people will go, well, I, I would argue that it's not. I go, no, no, listen. You know, when your back was fucked up, you didn't self-surgery, right? <laughs> I'm going to do this myself, right? You had to rely on an expert. And yeah. and one day you had a flat tire and you didn't have a spare tire. You called a tow truck, a AAA, right? You're, you're, you could be a handyman, but maybe you go, I'm not going to fix my own roof. I'm going to call a roof repair. In other words, what I'm saying is every problem in life, except for one, can be solved by making a phone call. And there's only one problem in life that you can't solve if, if it's happening right now. You don't even have to dial 911, and that's sudden violence, yeah. right? Um, and even you could say, well, no, but the problem of self-actualization, of overcoming fear, of, of understanding neuroplasticity, the, the reality is like that takes decades to cultivate that self-awareness and that skill set. This yeah. isn't like a, like a, a you know, pardon the deliberate pun, we don't take a pill to gain self-awareness like right. that. So my whole thing is this, is to teach people about safety and not to confuse self-defense with martial arts and not to confuse self-defense with a combat sport. And this has been the source of much confusion uh, in, in the industry um, because people will look at things of, of, of course, a lot of your listeners who are uh, uh, active or retired military or law enforcement, firefighters, first responders, you're familiar with the term, get to the left of the ambush, left of bang. Well, if you think about it, almost everyone practices when it comes to a physical skill set to the right of the ambush, right of bang. So if we say, hey guys, like don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So let me show you how to get out of a headlock. Let me show you how to get out of a strangle. Let me show you what to do if the guy's got a gun or a knife. Well, what you're starting there, I call it the Star Trek model. You're starting there where the bad guy's beamed down into your personal space and he's already started his attack. Yeah. So I look at like, well, what happened to what we call D1 and D2, detect and avoid, defuse and deescalate? The two thirds of this theoretical percentage have to do with situational awareness and everyone knows that, but then there's no way to practice or teach situational awareness. And then the deeper shift is, if your self-awareness is fucked up, your situational awareness is compromised. If you don't know that you're an asshole and that you're drinking and you're hanging out at the wrong bar, I mean, I love all these stories. Everyone goes, yeah, uh, I agree with kind of what you're saying, but you know, I always go to this bar and there's always a guy that stop. <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, like you don't have any self-awareness and situational awareness. If you're always getting into a fight at that bar, pick another bar or drink less or <laughs> don't yeah. go to that, or, you know what I'm saying? So That's all of this, I had to come to that conclusion myself, you know, like when I quit drinking, that was part of the deal was that, Hey man, like any issues that I had, as far as violence were concerned or getting fights and ending up in jail and this and that, <clears throat> I had to own my side of the fence and be like, well, what, what part of the equation am I in that? Yeah. And it's like, well, fucking, I'm the one that showed up. Right. So I just don't put myself in situations or I try to minimize the risk by, Hey, it's, I just don't go to those places it's, anymore. It's that. And it's, and I'd bring you back to the, the trailer story from last night. Yeah. It's I'm going to go do this and I want to do this and then and then being 
introspective enough with your self-awareness to go, wait a minute, this is changing my, and like yesterday, right after my session, I had a phone call at my office and they started uh, 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 talking to me about a, a, one of the fires in business, a big problem. Yeah. And I felt, I literally felt my SNS activate. Like I went from like a total mellow one to went up to a four and I felt my body change. And I said, okay, stop. Can't talk about this now. Talk to you later. Uh, okay, I'm the CEO. So it's like, okay. Yeah. Like, but it was like, I stopped it. This is the, so the whole, we created the three Ds, detect, diffuse, defend, detect and avoid, situational awareness, self-awareness, diffuse and de-escalate. Not just, and a lot of people when I say diffuse and de-escalate, they think that's me talking to you. So like I bump into you, you go watch it, asshole. I hit a nonviolent posture, I'm going, sir, I don't want any trouble. There's that part, but before that is your self-talk. Yep. Can you diffuse yourself? Can you go like, don't do this, you don't need this. Your kid's waiting in the car. Or if you step towards this guy, you know where this is gonna go. You know, it's so there's like, there's this internal D1, D2, D3, will I defend myself? And a push comes to shove, there's D3, which is defense. So detect and avoid, defuse and deescalate, and then defend. Most, and people don't do this maliciously, but this is just the body of my work over decades, is most of the people, like I train trainers and I coach coaches. And, and what I point out for them, I go, and there's a lot of guys that I train that could kick my fucking ass in the ring in the octagon, in the cage, in the street. Um, and, but I like, I look at that as like, you know, uh, Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard were both trained by Angelo Dundee. They could both kick Angelo Dundee's ass. Why did they hire him as a coach? Because he understood something more about mindset and psychology. It wasn't so much of like, hey, hit with those knuckles. I, Ali, do a punch now. Oh, thanks coach. Like. <laughs> right um you know and it's so deep i remember this is this is i hope you guys are digging this and i know i'm rambling a lot but That's i'm at awesome. a ufc with my daughter olivia so when we moved to california i've been traveling a lot it's 2010. i said i'm gonna take over right in your sea world right in your disney i've been on the road a ton if it was a very stressful time uh and uh, i said hey i've been absent a lot and i want to spend a weekend with you what do you want to do whatever it is, just you and me. She's like, really, Dad? Uh, I think she was like 11 or 12 at the time. Yeah. And uh, I said, yeah, whatever you want. I go, you got SeaWorld, 20 minutes away, Disney, an hour away, Universal, hour and a half, whatever you want. She goes, and I'm not joking. She looks at me, she goes, could we go to a UFC? And I'm like thinking, are you fucking kidding me? This is so amazing. My wife's not going to believe this. She's going to think I put her out, right? right? But it was like, yes, we can. So uh, uh, fortunately, I know some people. I mean, I bought the tickets, right. but I know people that I could give her a different experience, meet the fighters. Uh, I was there early watching them build, you know, the, this. Huh. So she had a real cool experience. So we had really good seats. But we're sitting there around a bunch of drunk people who don't know anything about fucking fighting. Right. right and they're yelling you know kill them and they're just yelling like random things that they saw on like some interview you know that so, so he's, and olivia she's sitting beside me and uh and i sponsored I, back in the day a bunch of mma guys from randy couture to diego sanchez bj pan a lot of uh, for my high gear suit that i designed yeah. and they would use it to dis practice ground and pound and and, and uh, protect their faces from elbows and shit like that yeah. um so Diego's fighting and he's getting his ass kicked and guys are yelling, Kimura, uh, arm bar, try like, not like moves that don't even make sense, right? Like ankle lock him, triangle. And they're just yelling shit and they're drunk. And, and uh, my, I look over and my daughter rolls her eyes, right? She does like one of these things. And I, I go, what was that for? And she points at the guys in front of us yelling. She says, these guys, like they don't even understand fighting. I said, well, if you were in Diego's corner, what would you tell him? She goes, well, duh, it's obvious. He needs to stop getting punched so much. <laughs> right, With, like look how genius that is, right? Right? Because people overcomplicate things. Like Josh, if you want to overcome your anxiety, I need you to do this, do this, do this, do this. As opposed to what your Zen master guy said, is like, hey, where's your head, man? Yeah. Take a deep breath, 
we're going to do this yep. for a minute, one second at a time, right? And that's how I would even intuitively coach a lot of guys. I go, hey, you got a three minute boxing round here. This is what I want you to think about for the, for, for the first 30 seconds, right? I would give, and, I, and, and, and this was an extrapolation of when I developed a whole program for multiple assailants, I would start off going, don't let the math beat you. If this is a choiceless choice and the fight is now, if you do nothing, what happens? You get your ass kicked yeah. or worse. If you do the wrong thing, what happens? You get your ass kicked. But it all starts with, if you didn't fear fear, what would you do? What's the mindset here? So if you're distracted from uh, uh, some exit strategy, some, I call it choose safety. It's our big mantra, hashtag choose safety. What's the safest thing I can do right now? A lot of people confuse choose safety with choosing safety, which doesn't get you where you want to be. Right. So it's a big distinction for everyone listening. Don't. It's not about playing it safe. It's about choosing safety. Sometimes the safest thing you can do is to charge the fucking active shooter. Sometimes the safest thing you can do is to barricade. And sometimes the safest thing you do is fucking play dead. You need to intelligently go, what is the safest thing I can do? Because that allows you to deploy part two of the plan. So when I designed this multiple assailant thing, I would start off, I go, hey, we got, we're gonna do scenarios with one person, two people, three people, we're gonna cascade, we're gonna build, we're gonna do these iterations. How many of you are looking forward to the three on one, the four on one? And you can see people, I go, don't let the math beat you. And they're like, what? I go, how many of you love to run? Like very few people, do you like to run? No, okay. not at all. Most people, if you're listening to this show and you like to run, fuck you, yes, uh, sir, right? Sir. But there are some people that like to run, but right. most people don't like to run. Right. And and again, not the semantics, I know a lot of people that run, uh, I would run because I knew that it was, that A, just the discipline of doing something I didn't like. Right. Uh, and I knew that you, you, you can't fake endurance. So I got to do sprints, I got to run hills, I got to do some shit back in the day when I was a lot more active. So I would run because it was psychologically the right thing to do. Yep. And uh, um, so what I would tell people, I say, I don't like to run. So if I, if somebody says to me today, I want you to run a mile, if my coach says he program a mile, I would say, okay, but I would secretly only do four 400s, right? And if you're a little bit good at math, you realize that running four 400s is a mile. And so what I was doing was applying the same psychology. And when I said this, you can't see this, but Josh smiled when I said that, right? right? So if anyone here and out here in the, into the CrossFit world, you know, everyone hates burpees. Uh, sorry, everyone hates uh, thrusters. People hate burpees too, but people hate thrusters. So when I was coaching athletes, uh, and they'd say, yeah, but what if thrusters come up? I go, so don't do a thruster. They go, but yeah, but what if Dave programs it? I go, you never have to do a thruster again. I'm going to tell you how to sneak this in. And they like lean forward and I go, do you like doing push press? They're like, yeah. I go, what about a squat? Yeah. I go, if you do a squat and a push press together under load, that's a fucking thruster. And they would smile because what I was doing was I was breaking up the movements yeah. into manageable, right? So I was taking something that was in their psychological holy shit zone yep. and I was putting it into their comfort discomfort zone. And they went, you know, I could do that. Totally. It's fucking, you know, it, it's it's so empowering and so potent. And it's, and it's just so simple. Um, I had a fighter I was coaching. It was amateur kickboxing. Amateur kickboxing matches are four rounds long. The, when you're just, before you fight a, sorry, uh, for title fights, they're yeah. four rounds long. Uh, and this is amateur. So all of their fights are three rounds, you're gonna fight for the title, it's a four round fight. So I'm, I'm downstairs locker room, warming up my guy. His name's Sean, I say, hey Sean, how do you feel? He says, I'm nervous coach, but you know, fucking I'm about to get in a fight, right? Yeah. I go, fucking right, man. I said, listen, and this is back in the Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberta Duran days, uh, boxing. For those of you listening who don't know what boxing is, just Google it. It's, <laughs> it's where they just use their hands. Um, and so uh, uh, so I said, I said to him, I said, if this guy looks at you and he's got that Roberta Duran, you know, hands of stone, eyes of like stone face on, he's looking at you and he's just staring at you, know this his physiology is fucking lit up and that his heart is pounding and his breathing is tight because he's about to get in a fight right so the facade is our body language you know emerson said what goes on around you compares a little with what goes on inside you yeah. so are you self-aware do you understand that he goes thanks coach man you know we fucking pop gloves i go sit down he's shadow boxing he's moving around and something starts to nag at me josh i'm sitting there and it's nagging at me nagging at me and all of a sudden i realize fuck 
And I look over at Sean, I go, Sean, I gotta apologize. He goes, why? I said, cause I just gave you the Zen fortune cookie answer. He goes, no man, it like, like really calmed me down. Like I knew that I was like, my head was in the right place. I go, yeah, but, but I didn't ask you what you were afraid of. Cause he could have been afraid of my mom's watching this fight. My yeah. girlfriend's at ringside. I'm worried about getting my eight kick minimum in per round. I didn't tell you about this rib injury from sparring and it's, you know, yeah. like it could have been. So fear of the unknown versus fear of the known is a totally different place. And uh, so I said to him, I go, no, like, like I gave you a Zen fortune cookie answer. A great custom adequate. The difference between the hero and the coward is what they do with their fear, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. But that doesn't change the science and psychology of studying fear and then making it use making it useful and and exploited by you in a positive way. So I said, what exactly are you afraid of? I said, exactly. He goes, it's stupid. I didn't want to. I go, no, it's not stupid. If it's triggering a fear, what is it? He goes. Well, like I've done 10 rounds like preparing. I've done 10 rounds in the gym, but I realized this is the first time I've ever done four rounds in a real fight. And I know I can do 10, huh. but it's different when it's a real fight. And I looked at him, I go like, I would have never have guessed that. So here we have, and this is a great lesson in life, guys, of how what I mean by fear can kill you because it kills your potential because you're 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 not 110% focused on like a sniper, the shot you want to take. You're thinking about, you know, oh shit, what about this? What about this? So you're, at, you're actually carrying some extra weight that you realize, you know, you didn't need to, yeah. right? Um, and so I looked at him and, and this is how, uh, transcendent all of this research is. I took my uh, multiple assailant concept and immediately applied it to this. I said, I said, Sean, you're worried you can, if you can do four rounds? He goes, I thought, yeah, I guess. I said, can you do two rounds? He goes, yeah, of course. I said, so just do two rounds twice. Huh. And he looked at me and he smiled at the end of the second round in the fight. I looked at him, I leaned in the corner, squirts water in his mouth. I go, can you do two rounds? He goes, fuck yeah, right? Like it was just, yeah. don't let the math beat you. So coming back to the multiple assailant, if I say to you, would you defend yourself against one person? Yeah. You go, yeah. I go, what about two? Most people go, yeah. I go, what about three? Then they're like, if I had to, but you can see the, hes the hesitation in the fictitious scenario in your mind is also the actual timeline of hesitation in the street. Now, this isn't like scientific algorithm, right? but if I can say to you, would you do this? And you go, yeah. And I go, would you do this? And you go, yeah. And what about this? And you're like, and now it's three seconds. Like, ah. like that's going to parallel or replicate itself somewhere else unless you've explored it, ah, right? Sure. So you got to stress inoculate. But all of that is, this is, is, is coming down and then doing the drills and having it make sense. Now, this is all part of this continuation of like, how did you get started? Uh, <laughs> like from like nine days ago. Yeah. And then me telling you this story about this doctor, right. uh, presser. So this has always been, and, and people have asked me like, 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 how do you know this stuff? And I really believe it was because I was trying to solve a massive problem for myself. And, the, and there wasn't, I didn't have enough self-awareness because this weird thing, you can't experiment on yourself all the time. Oh. And it was having this sort of intuitive insight. There's a Latin expression, uh, qui dos et deset, those who teach learn. So I've been a teacher for fucking 43 years. Right. And when a student, like when my students are doing stuff, my heart is pounding. My fucking body's on fire. Yeah. When, if they're, if they're sparring, if they're in the ring, if they're about to do a scenario, I'm like inside them yeah. and it's, it's, it's fucking, it's intense. Yeah. And so they'd move and I'd like, I'd flinch with them. If they got hit, I'd get hit. And so I was so, so connected to them. I wanted to solve their problem. Yeah. I wanted to solve the problem of, and the first I thought the problem was arsenal. I thought the problem was arsenal. I got into a fight when I was 15 years old. Guy, um, uh, he was a class nerd, literally like the guy with the big black glasses with the tape in the middle, yeah. you know? And but he was also a bit of a dick. He wasn't one of like, he wasn't like just picked on 
He, yeah. he, like he'd get in, he was a shit disturber yeah. and the nerd. So he's always getting in trouble and teachers out of the room and something uh, starts and I just happened to walk in. I was a little bit late and I'm standing there and I know all the guys involved here, but I'm standing right near it. And one of the guys gets down on, on his hands and knees behind, you know, to do the thing where you're going to do the yeah. practical joke, push your buddy over him. <laughs> yeah. So this guy shoves this guy, this guy Lance, can't believe I remembered his name, Lance falls over this guy trips and falls like into the teacher's like a storage closet where where like all the stationery was kept and everything, yeah. but hits that uh, you know aluminum cabinet boom loud, the whole class starts laughing because he doesn't hurt himself but he's embarrassed, right. and I start laughing because it's contagious. Everyone's laughing, but when he got up, he thought I was I was the guy that had was behind him and tripped him, yeah. so he fucking shoves me really violently and I go back. And he starts to come at me and I just run. I don't know why, it's just behavioral. I just, I kind of dart, I move, I scramble around some desks. He chases me, I get to the back of the wall and my hands come up and what we call it is 15 years old. This is like like over a decade before I developed the whole spear system. Mm-hmm. Fingers are splayed, outside 90, I'm pushing away danger. I go, stop, stop, man, it wasn't fucking me. And he's in front of me and his carotids are pumping. He's like, <sighs> he goes, you fucking pushed, you, you fucking tripped me. That wasn't funny. I go, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And he's not listening. I could see he's enraged. He's like, like, uh. like, his neck is pumping. He's turning red, and uh, I'm like laughing. I'm going, Lance, it wasn't me. And I can hear in one side of my head, my my taekwondo instructor, Alex. If I catch any of you fighting or hear of any of you fighting outside the school and it's not real self defense, you're out, uh. done. And I loved my I loved my training. I trained every day of the week. Uh. Um, on the other side of my head, and I had my back to a wall. He's in front of me, he's pointing, he's threatening me, he's poking me, and I'm trying to defuse it because on one side of my head, you know, the angel's going, don't fucking do it. You'll get kicked at this, we'll get back to Alex. Uh The other side is, he's too close to kick, he's too close to kick, he's too close to kick. My unconscious bias, and listen carefully to this, to everyone out here who's maybe interested in personal safety and self-defense, when you train in a single modality, if you're only trained with a sniper rifle, and all you know is a sniper rifle, and now you're in an elevator, and a guy, you know, suddenly you see like the imprint of a gun, and he's starting to reach, you're about to get mugged, and all you know is Barrett 50 caliber, yeah. and distance, and like, and you're, so, like, your brain doesn't know what to do yet. You're fucked. Right? And if all you, you know, and if all you know is close quarter tactics, and how to get behind somebody, and there's a guy shooting at you from across the street, like your brain is downloading the shit that it knows right? You predispose yourself to go there first. And I'm not saying you can't adapt and overcome, but that's just the way the brain, the brain's a big fucking computer and it memorizes shit and it's trying to predict the future. And so that's why I say, be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. The thing is to decide what is the most important thing to practice. And then what is the uh, support elements or recreational enjoyment or cultural uh, benefits of something else? So here I am, he's pushing me against the wall, but I've been doing for three years now, religiously, Taekwondo, which is predominantly a kicking art. All the strikes, there's like two classic ones, a back fist and a reverse punch back in the day. And they were used to set up your side kick, your round kick, what have you. So I got my back to him wall, so I can't create space. He's in front of me about to go nuts. I'm psychologically not ready to fight because I'm trying to defuse it. Yeah. I wasn't even there. I wasn't physically involved. I've got my instructor in my head going, don't do it, don't do it. And then I got my tactical like my territorial imperative protective self going he's too close to kick he's too close to kick he's too close to kick literally this is going on and he shoves me again and i see and there's just that moment when you know shit's about to blow right Right. there's just that moment you go here we go and i realized that he was about to sucker punch me i could just see the way he was blading and the way he was pumping his fists and his and the way he was breathing and his eyes and he says you're a fucking pussy and and i look at him and he goes, I'll let you have the first punch. And I knew that at, like, like the, that a second after he said the word punch, he was going to swing. Right. I just knew. And so I hit him on the letter U of the word punch. Right. right? So my hands were up trying to like pat in the air going, calm down, calm down. And he goes, I'll let you have the first. And I throw probably the shittiest jab. I think my sister could throw a better punch. Are we okay here? Yeah, we're good. Okay. I should, I should go on time. Um, and uh, I throw the shittiest jab ever. It hits him in the face because we're really close. He rocks back and he throws the punch he was about to throw. It came right off that, but my hand's on its way back from his face as this punch reels around. So I was right, sucker punch was coming. Yeah. My punch did nothing other than delay that. 
Yeah. But what happened was when he when his punch came in, my body's startle flinch response kicked in, and my hands came up. And what the startle flinch does, it, it's 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 part of our two million year old brain. What the startle flinch does is it tries to protect the command center of your head, and then if there's time and space, it'll push away danger. The hands will come out. That's the the uh, cross extensor reflex. Um, his hand, because of that, because of my pushing away danger and covering my head, his f- hand careens off my forearm, so I never get hit in the face. But it bounces off my forearm. We end up in this shitty clinch. Well, I had wrestled for years, yeah. and I'd competed a little in wrestling. And I and his head was right there. I grabbed him by the hair and the arm, and I did an improvised hip throw. So I went. It was his punch triggers a startle flinch. The flinch uh, uh, created a reaction, almost like an organic airbag. It just deployed. Hands came up. His arm bounced off my arms. I grabbed him by the head, fucking swung him over my hip. He bounced off the classroom floor, which fucking hurt because it wasn't a mat. Oh, yeah. My hands were still on his hair. And in that moment, I grabbed him, still holding him, and I flung him into the desk right beside us, which kind of nailed him from behind and winded him. He's on the ground, like out of breath, looking up at me. And at that point, I'm pointing at him, like in kind of like a low Elvis Presley stance, like that martial <laughs> arts stance, right? And I scream, if you get up, I'll fucking kill you. Now, clearly I wasn't gonna kill him, but this Vesuvius of emotion erupted from me. And it was at that moment I had this observation. This is the first time that I'm actually in a martial arts stance in the fight, and it was the end of the fight. Yeah. Um, There's a difference between a real violent encounter and a street fight, and I'm doing my best to kind of re-educate the world in new definitions for violence and fear, and, and defining a street fight which is usually something you could avoid from a violent encounter which is something you can't avoid and the distinctions are morally ethically and legally uh, uh important so all of this and i was talking about this is huge as everyone tracking there's 19 stories going on here is as soon as i finished i was just getting my learner's permit i signed up for a boxing uh at a boxing gym and what's amazing about this is that i was so upset with the fight because I didn't, I didn't side kick him. I didn't round kick him. Like there's a part of me that just expected all my years of training would manifest itself, and then I would, ex, you know, uh, I, this move would come out, and I'd go, "Kia, yeah, I can do this move." Yep. And the chaos and emotion of it. Of course, I was adrenalized. I was like lying in bed at night thinking about this. I didn't lose, but I didn't win. Yeah, it was like one of those things that, as an introspective person, I was like, "What the fuck just happened there?" Yeah. But here's the amazing thing: I don't want anybody who teaches or practices self-defense to meditate on this. I assumed what was missing was a piece of my arsenal, so I realized if I had had a better strike, he would not have thrown that. Had I stopped him with a good, solid, stiff jab or a cross or a one-two, and so I went and studied and. Post uh, boxing, I got into other confrontations that had the exact same uh, 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 understory. Didn't matter what the physicality was. Uh-huh. It was like I had a road rage thing that came out where I realized I was stuck in the car and this guy, I was pinned in traffic and this guy, I looked in my side view mirror, accidentally cut somebody off and he's fucking running towards the car. And I went, This is fucked. If he breaks the window, I'm in my seatbelt. I, like, I don't. So I jump out and and he meets like it's like a charging like rhino at me as I get out of the car. And next thing we know, we're like I'm rolling across the trunk of the car with this guy in this freaking orgy of pathetic fucking shit movement. And then a couple of people broke us up. And like like it took me two days to come down from that. And I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Again, like like there was no technique. And so. I started looking at the chaos of sudden violence versus, because a lot of people online, they talk about violence, but what they're really talking about is a douchebag fight. And I define a douchebag fight as where you have a certain amount of skills and you let the fight happen because you know your boxing or your MMA, your Taekwondo or your, and there's other legit shit, but you know, uh, most fights can be avoided. It's, oh, yeah, sure. and, and we don't avoid them because we don't understand D1 and D2. Right. So. All of this evolved into one day one of my students got his ass kicked and I'd been training him for a few months for a real bully, serious bully situation in school. And uh, he got dropped by a left hook. And when I asked him, how the hell did you get dropped by a left hook? Why didn't you slip, bob and weave? Why didn't you do any of the stuff we practiced? And he said, when he described the fight, and I'm skipping a bunch of, I told the story on a bunch of other podcasts, but I jumped to the key of it. It was a a fight in school and it had never been physical until today. And my student, Mitch, had 
had enough and just emotionally grabbed the guy and verbally pleaded with him to leave him the fuck alone. Right. It's like, just fucking leave me alone. But he grabbed him after the guy had shoved him. The guy had tripped him and shoved him. And and Mitch said, you're such a fucking asshole. And the guy said, what did you say? And it was the first time Mitch had asserted. And he walks up to him like nose to nose, like a douchebag. What did you say? Say it again. He goes, you're a fucking asshole. Shoves him. He goes, what do you do about it? And Mitch, at that moment, right, it's it's that, that, that you know, who's, whose dick is bigger, right? right? You're 15. Mitch grabs him, shoves him against a locker and screams, leave me the fuck alone. I don't even know who you are. You've been bugging me since school started. Right. And he's telling me the story. He goes, and I go, and he goes, that's when he hit me. I go, so what, like, why didn't you parry? Why didn't you block? Why didn't you slip? And he says, well, I was holding him with my left hand and I had my books in my other hand. And in that moment, Josh was like the God of self-defense fucking hit me with this lightning bolt. And I literally said, oh my God, we teach self-defense wrong. It was on that day, it was 1980, I think like October 15th. I don't remember the date. It was 7.03, the sun was, I don't fucking remember. (laughs) But it was 1980 and I realized, oh my God, what I'd been doing is teaching self-defense by teaching what other people taught me. I was intuitively blending some of the mindset and, and stuff as, again, I was very young, but what I was teaching was arsenal. I was filling a toolbox, not realizing that if we couldn't manage our emotional, psychological self, we weren't going to manage the tools. And so it was like, okay, are you a handyman? Are you a carpenter? Or are you an architect? Do you understand the blueprint of violence? Do you understand the architectural, both your uh, uh, role in that and the role of violence and all of the, the contaminants and contagious ripple effects of it all? You so see this that is, a lot, right, with martial arts. What's that? You see that a lot with martial arts is that you have guys that, you know, I trained in Wing Chun for a little bit, and I've done Taekwondo, uh, a little bit of Jiu Jitsu, and there was guys that would be training forever. They're just like, that's all they ever did was train. But it's like, you ever get in a real street fight, I wouldn't want you next to me. You know what I mean? Like, you're good in, in the studio, but outside of the studio, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Listen, there are outliers who guys that are good, depending on how they were brought up, you know, you know, the grandfather was ex SF and taught them this. And there's like, there's always these outlier stories. Yeah. But in general, if you look up the definition of, 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 uh, uh violence, um, of self-defense, most, most dictionary definitions will say something to the effect of the physical act of protecting your property or your life or your yeah. body. And so even the world's definition of self-defense starts after the attack, right? It starts at D3. Yeah. We created two years ago a new definition, and hopefully one day that'll be what's in the Merriam-Webster. It's when danger, uh, it's it's the, the decision to choose safety when danger is imminent. Yeah. The decision to choose safety when danger is imminent. What that means is as soon as I recognize a fear spike, because there's always a fear spike before a problem happens. Every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack, Yeah. right? And so if you can learn like, hey, this is what they mean by get to the left of bang, get to the left of ambush. But if we say that, and then we start our training on our knees grappling, or we start our training in a clinch, or we start our training like doing the gun disarm and the guns out here, it's the Star Trek model. It's like, how did he get there? Right. I'm not saying, and this is where people fuck up and they, and they misquote me and they're selective listeners. Right. They go, Blower said that our shit doesn't work. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you could choose safety, what is the safest thing you could do? And that would be to start deploying a plan the second you recognize danger. The second you recognize danger is the moment you get a fear spike. You still haven't necessarily identified all the danger. You just suddenly went, this isn't right. Something's wrong here. Right. So 1980, I start, I completely reversed how I, I uh, taught self-defense and started only doing scenario training, developed a system called the, the panic attack drill, ironically for a name. It's now, we've dropped that name back in the 80s and we now call it ballistic microfight, ballistic, not kinetic, ballistic like explosive, yeah. uh, small fight. Because if you take care of everything else, there is no fight, Yeah. right? It's a, it's a butterfly effect. And uh, so it was during the 80s that this guy, Dr. Presser, Remember Dr. Presser, everybody, uh, uh, uh. right? Uh, he may not be alive still, this is how long the story is. Uh, but he uh, um, he says, uh, so he started training with me like in the late 80s. So I'd really, I'd already created what, what I call the Cerebral Self-Defense Program. It's an audio tape that we sell just on all this mindset. Uh, um, I'd started experimenting with the spear system, the whole startle flinch, which is, again was, I was like an archeologist 
like uncovering shit, right? And telling people, hey, you all, you're all you all human weapons, you're just domesticated, yeah. right? And so if you if you focus just on the, the single physical aspect, you create the unconscious bias like I did when I was 15, he's too close to kick, he's too close to kick. Where had I been a grappler, like more, I didn't think of, I did, at the time I didn't think about wrestling as a self-defense modality. Yeah. Now, if you're a wrestler, it's shut and double leg, take the guy down, yeah. right? Uh, but back then, that my 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 singular focus was Taekwondo, yeah. and what it is, it, it it clouded my my strategic optimization opportunities. Right, it's just my head was just somewhere else. So I started doing all the scenario training, which changed everything. We would do things like we and it got pretty legendary. Once a month, people would come in, and I'd have them write down. I'd say, "These are the scenarios you're going to face today: drunk on the street, uh, uh, a loan shark that you borrowed money from, and and he's got to break something, but you're going to try and talk him out of it." Like I'd give people like these things that that could or could maybe wouldn't ever happen. So it took them out of the ring. Yeah. I didn't want you sparring. I go, hey, Josh, put this gear on, go stand over there, go sit down, you're at the bus stop, and uh, one or two uh, um, uh, homeless dudes are going to come up to you and, and try and, you know, you know, strong arm you for some money. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, fuck. And, and people would go, well, I would just do this. And, I, and I'd have them write out what, you, what would you do. And then, and I trained people. We had a program called Be a Good Bad Guy. We would train role players how to move because the bad guy controls the fight he influences how you feel he influences what you do by the level of danger you feel that you're in right. it wasn't just you know so people would go i go hey what would you do if somebody grabbed you by the lapel slammed you against the wall and started screaming at you i did this as a social experiment years ago before social experiments were a thing right. i did this online on mmadt.tv so yeah. this is like a, like an underground fight type a ah, like yeah. no fear right <laughs> The question was, you're in a bar, you get in a fight with somebody, they grab you by the lapel, slam you against the wall, scream at, start screaming at you, what do you do? Uh, I'm gonna let this uh, thread grow for a day and then I'm gonna come back and comment. 73 answers from eye gouge, knee to the nuts, box the ears, uh, uh, hit to the throat, all the, all the more physical moves. Everyone listening is, all of them were physical moves. Yeah. Nobody said, what's the scenario? Nobody said, who is the person? I came on the next day and I typed, very, very interesting. So you've went out for a drink with your on again, off again, girlfriend or boyfriend. You guys got into another on again, off again fight. You were drinking. You said, you know what? I don't want to fight you. I'm a fight with you. I'm leaving. Let's try this again another time. I love you, but I don't know if we can be together. You get up and you turn around. Your girlfriend grabs you spins you by the lapels, slams you against the wall, and because there's a band playing, screams at you, don't fucking turn your back on me, I love you, let's work this out. And you just need your girlfriend in the balls. Yep. And I wrote that, and the thread went berserk. Everyone was angry with me, they felt like I tricked them. <laughs> Nobody said, holy fuck, there's a different way to look at violence. Huh. Our, in all our training is what's the scenario? Because the scenario is going to determine the legal, the moral, the ethical boundaries of force paralleling danger. And there's a whole bunch of other shit that has to happen before you even think, oh, I'll just shoot him yeah. or I'll break his neck or I'll do this. So I totally revamped uh, self-defense training. That's when, I just, that's when Waldo Presser, his first name was Waldo, because you can tell he's going to be a professor. <laughs> uh, um, so he's this professor in school. He's also the, uh, the, the head of psychiatry at the Royal Vic. He asked me, like, where did you get all this stuff? I said, studying violence, studying victims of violence, coaching people who, you know. And he says, would you come to the hospital and talk to my colleagues? So I'm like, fuck yeah. Huh? He goes, I go, like, well, who is it? He says, like, it's the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry. Fuck yeah, let's do this. I'm like 27. The day of the event, I realize I'm scared shitless. Now I'm scared shitless, folks, to go talk about fear management. Do we understand the irony? Right. What I did is I said I'm 27. No, I did. I didn't even fucking finish uh, uh, college. Finished high school, dropped out of college, and developed a, like a new way to look at self defense. Huh. And here I am going to talk. So number one fear for most people in the world is public speaking. Oh, totally. Um, I had never done any public speaking other than teaching in my classes, but that's a captive audience. So this is like, holy shit. Um, I'm sweating. I'm nervous. I got butterflies in my stomach. I get in there. They're like all in suits. They got all like uh, uh, um, legal pads and pens and they're sitting around. It looked like a, uh, 
like a room and a table of uh, like I visualize a picture of a movie, uh, like Twelve Angry Men. When you're in the room, when you're in the room, I just say to myself, none of your listeners know what that movie is. <laughs> uh, you know where where the jury's meeting to discuss like is this like fucking electric chair or not, right? Right. It's like they're all sitting there like this, and I'm like, oh fuck, man, like I'm on trial, and uh, and I said, hey, like this is my contention that the physiology of fear and conventional uh, 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 information about fight, flight, freeze is, while that's valuable to study, but that's only valuable to study post-incident, that it does nothing for us during the incident. Yeah. Like if I'm there and I'm being chased by, by a bad guy, I'm going, oh, this is flight. Uh, my uh, start of flinch response is like, it doesn't matter. I need to fucking figure out how to get to safety. So I do this whole thing and like, and there nobody's asking a question. My heart's pounding and I start talking, I'm talking, I'm sweating and I'm remembering to breathe. And then I do this talk, I had something like uh, maybe 90 minutes, maybe less. So I do this whole thing and uh, stream of consciousness, just like our talk today. Yeah. And uh, the guy at the end who's sitting beside Dr. Presser, he taps his pen on his pad. They haven't written a fucking thing down. So I'm thinking, because they know my relationship with Presser, they've generously given me 90 minutes of their time. They're going to thank me very much. But this must suck because they haven't said, stop. Or, right. <laughs> you know, where did you go? And uh, so I finish, I go, so kind of that's it, guys. That's my, and obviously it was way longer, right? You know, right. And uh, the guy, he goes, uh, taps his pen, puts it on his tooth. He goes, this concept of differentiating between the psychology of fear and biology of fear, like wh wh what's its origin? Where did you get that? And I realized at that moment, I was onto something. Yeah. Because they were like, they were just listening like as if they were in a talk. They weren't, I thought they were there judging and they would have been if I was like an asshole, yeah. right? And I was just sharing. And, uh, and I knew at that point, this was fucking it. Right, yeah. and I actually, I, because I'm a sarcastic prick, I said, "Well, while you guys were studying Jung and Freud, I was actually talking to people who survive violent attacks, and asking them what the hell was going on, yeah. because the, diff, the 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 thread that connected the behavior of the victim and the and the victor was how they thought about fear at that moment, right? Yeah. And so that that's been kind of my journey, my life, like literally all my life and even like to last week and to yesterday or today like i wake up in the morning and and it's it's almost like i'm on i'm a uh, um a, a radar specialist in the air force yeah. right who walks in in his new shift and he's checking just to make sure we're not being attacked yeah. like it's fear based right away like it's like you know or or something goes off and you you immediately alert to that and go no we're okay that's just you know it's just not important right but you got to check it out so i wake up in the morning and i'm listening at my sns and i'm checking the pain in my neck and i'm checking the pain in my back and then when i every day I, like i get up and i'm waiting for some of the stenosis issues in my spine as i'm walking i'm going okay i feel pretty good today okay but then to catch myself that there's a moment when I can go, I wonder if the next step's gonna hurt versus you're fucking okay, you're better than yesterday. Yep. That's self-awareness. That could be super debilitating too, you know, cause I, I talked to a guy that, and it helped me because for the longest time, because of all the back surgeries and whatnot, whenever I feel some kind of pain, you know, like, oh shit, I got like sciatica going down my leg. Ah, oh, fuck, am I, is, is my, back messed up again you know what, right. did I do? what did i do and i start going through my head you know taking an inventory of all the things i've done how much driving driving have i been doing right. have i been stretching properly have i been doing you know proper body movements and um you go down this rabbit hole of anxiety with it you know and one of the things he told me was like listen the first thing you need to understand is pain is not life-threatening Right. And when he told me that, for some people, they're like, ah, that's bullshit. But for me, it meant a lot because that's where a lot of my anxiety would go. I'd go down this rabbit hole of like straight panic, you know, because it's like, fuck, man, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I was afraid of, and that's, I mean, just owning it. Like, I was afraid of fear, of pain. I was afraid right. of being in pain. It sucks. So what I always do with that, Josh, is is is, uh, is anything anyone says, no, but it was my pain. No, but it was that girl. No, but it was, yeah. it was the, I thought I was going to lose my business. Um people try to assign it to something else and it all comes down to fear. Yeah. Because if I go, well, what does the pain mean? Like, 
Like if the pain meant you were going to have sex, you'd go give me more pain, right? Like, <laughs> right. right? If yeah. the pain meant, if the pain meant like every time my foot hurts, a thousand dollars appears like on the table, yeah. you'd be stubbing your toe, right? So what like, meaning I'm, are we assigning I, to I'm like, yeah. yeah, but it's what it is. It's, but the meaning is always fear because what we haven't done as a society, it's, it's one of my missions now is to re-educate people. Imagine growing up as a kid where I was taught that when you feel fear, uh, it's a signal that you're moving outside your comfort zone into your discomfort zone. And beyond that is your holy shit zone. And there's a moment here where you stop and you go, is this path and this journey going to help evolve you? Is it going to help self-actualize? Is it, is it better to right. understand this? Uh, because every time you move away from it, you potentially impact your self-esteem or your dignity, depending on the scope of the stimulus, yep. right? So I'm not cavalier about this. I, I was down at Fort Bragg, given a course many years ago, and uh, came in a couple of days early and uh, uh, met at a coffee shop. There were a, a couple of the guys that are gonna train and they go, hey, we're going jumping this afternoon, do you wanna come? And I go like, like jumping up and down on the floor. <laughs> and they laugh and I knew what they meant. Right. And uh, they said, ha ha ha, nice. I said, no, I'm good. No, no, actually no interest. He goes, I thought you're like Mr. Fear Management. Air quotes, guys, you can't see this, it's an audio. <laughs> I'm doing air quotes. I thought you're Mr. Fear Management. I said, yeah, I am Mr. Fear Management. I am now managing my fear by saying no. Yeah. So they laughed again and they go, you sure? I go, uh, I go, yeah, I've done it twice. I'm afraid of heights and I've jumped out of an airplane twice. twice. How do you do that if you're afraid of heights, if you can't manage your fear? That was my experiment. Yeah. Did a static line, then I did a tandem, uh, 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 12,000 feet. Nobody knew I was going, so if things didn't work out well, nobody, you know, nobody would know. Huh. Um, and uh, just before uh, the door opened on the plane, I looked at the guy that was my, uh, my jump master who I was gonna latch onto, huh. and I looked at him and I said, hey, how you doing? He goes, good, how are you, how are you feeling? So I'm fucking, you know, I think I'm pretty calm or my heart is racing so fast I can't tell the difference because I don't like heights. He laughed, he said, you'll be fine. I said, can I ask you another question? He goes, yeah. I said, like, how are things at home? He goes, what? I go, like, you having any problems? Are you feeling suicidal? You know, are you on any medications I don't know about? He goes, no, like the, the sleep app, uh, the, uh, what's the thing when you fall asleep? Uh, when, you, when you pass out, uh, shit, I just forgot the name fucked up the story. Uh, narcolepsy? Yeah. He said that my, my narcolepsy meds are working great. <laughs> so I fucking laugh. I go, you prick. He goes, you'll be fine. Right? So I'm making like jokes, that nervous right. joke just before yeah. you're maybe about to die. Yeah. Right? I literally, and those of you, again, who've, who've jumped understand this, is uh, he clips me in, uh, door opens. And what I do is like, we're, you know, a few seconds out, I lean forward. No, you didn't ask me, you didn't tell me. I lean forward because I want to hear the, the fucking rings yeah. on our gear click and feel just in case he was tricking me and he didn't. Like, like that's the tactical Tony, right? Going yeah. click, yeah, I'm attached to him, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I said, uh, it, it was funny. So we jumped and it was amazing, amazing. I was high for days. It was a fucking amazing experience. Yeah. Um, so I knew I could do it. And that's the whole point here is I went outside my comfort zone into my holy shit zone to go, this is what the mind is possible of. But so here I am at Bragg, <clears throat> excuse me. Here I am at Bragg and the guy says, so you wanna jump? I go, no, it's good, I'm good with it. And uh, I go, uh, are you uh, afraid of skydiving? Right. He goes, not at all. I go, so here's the thing is I know people who are afraid of skydiving and I know people who skydive because they need to re retain their qualification, but they don't like it. Right. Right. So if you're not afraid of it, there's no fear management needed. Huh. If you are afraid of it and you go, that's fear management. So he looks at me and I go, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody. Uh, he looks at me and I go, hey, so you have no fear? He goes, no. Nope. I go, that's cool. I go, uh, let me pack your chute for you. He goes, fuck you. I go, that's fear. Right, so there's a point where I can introduce a new element to your ritual where the protector of yourself says, wait a minute, 
the guy that packed my chute, does he know what he's doing? Yep. Because now I'm in potential danger and now I've got fear, right? So it's an amazing, amazing, so this, this is kind of this long, like a long story metaphor for this onion. We can call it whatever we want, but at the end of the day, what I really believe is that it comes down to fear. And if we change our relationship with fear, we change how we manage confrontations, any confrontation. And if you change how you manage confrontation, you change your fucking day, your week, and your life. How do you balance it all? I mean, the reason that I, uh, that I asked that was like, for example, lately um, I've been taking classes, like shooting classes, you know? Yeah. And I feel like if I, if I own firearms, I should probably know how to use them pretty efficiently. And so it's important to me. It's a, I think it's a perishable skill, so it's something that I really want to learn. The other thing that's very important to me is obviously my family and being able to have the skills and the mindset to protect them should the need arise. Um, but one of the things I struggle with is balance of that. So it's like I have my gun. You know, it's, it's accessible when I go to sleep at night. But there was a part of me in my life where I felt just completely untouchable. I didn't even need a gun next to my nightstand. I right. was all right. And... Uh, I just felt like nothing could bother me. I was, I was in the flow and things were cool. And I was the vibration I was putting out was definitely not one of confrontation at all. Um, but then I wonder to myself now, like looking back on those days, like how much of that was being naive and how much of that was just being, you know, Zen about everything around me, you know? And, and so for me, I'm trying to find that walk of where it's like, I'm comfortable in my environment. I'm comfortable around everybody around me. I can go out in public and be totally cool. But at the same time, I'm prepared and willing to go to the next level if I need to. Because I know a lot of, I, I'm certain there's a lot of people that struggle with that balance. Yeah, uh, I like I don't have, I, I wish I wish I had a, a uh, surgical answer that was clickbait and got everyone to go buy something online, <laughs> right. right? Well, if you just have my uh, audio tape, uh, this video. Yeah. The answer is like, the, the answer is is really, you know, I don't know why this popped in my head, but like, why do you eat meat versus why are you vegan? Like, why are you vegetarian? And that might seem like a bizarre right. answer, but is it is it political? Is it health? Is it digestive? Is it is it clinical? Is it is it emotional? So like, why do you have a gun now, right? Huh. So did something happen to you that makes you realize that maybe you can't handle things as physically, dynamically, is there anything in your life that might have changed how long and how hard you can fight for? Oh, yeah. Maybe six back surgeries. Yeah, yeah. You know, your kid's getting older. Did something through osmosis, some home invasion, some murder, something at some point when you were feeling vulnerable go, fuck, it's better to have a gun and not need it than to need a gun and not have it, right? Yeah, totally. Um, now I could say that to anybody, yeah. but if they're a vegetarian when it, or vegan when it comes to guns, yeah. it doesn't matter. Does that make any? Did I go no, off on no, too no, weird no. Of it? it makes perfect sense right? because, like, I've, I've had this conversation with other people, and, and same thing where it's like it's fucking weird. Um, that, you right? know, they always use the analogy of like I'm. Uh, they're like, well, there's lions in the world, and there's gazelles, and they're like, I'm the gazelle, and you're the lion. I was like, well, so you mean to tell me if someone broke into your home that you're just going to run from them? You're not going to shield them and protect them? And and I would just because I'm a different makeup. Like I, I don't buy that. So this is this is again fear. Yeah. If I through truth, truth serum, unpeeled that, that onion on that person, yeah. what they would end up saying is, I'm afraid I would die. I'm afraid I, I'm afraid I would lose. Right. If you're thinking about losing, so in w one of the slides in our Be Your Own Bodyguard course and our, all of our courses it's, it's in actually, is uh, the psychology of intimidation is when you're visualizing what your opponent is doing to you instead of what you must do to your opponent. Oh yeah. It's that shift. It's like, yeah. you know, a guy comes in and he says, you better cooperate with me or I'm gonna fucking kill you. And you go, I better cooperate him or he's gonna kill me. As opposed to, okay, when am I gonna fucking make my move? How am yeah. I gonna make my move? Yeah. And sometimes, so like there's 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 four stages to any confrontation management. And that is one, one is situation awareness, then a fear spike, then managing your fear, then figuring out what the safest thing to do is at that point. Those are the four, and they're very abstract, right? So, uh, you know, the, the, the idea for me, and I, you know, again, I gave a very philosophical answer with regards to the balance of the gun and this and that, is you do things when you want to, when you're ready. Do you know how many people I've met that have said, I always want to learn how to defend myself? And they say it with a smile and exuberance. Yeah. I'd be a gazillionaire for every person who, when they found out what I did, went, oh my God, I always want to learn how to defend myself. 
And I very often, if I'm in the mood to, I go, no, you didn't. And they go, well, why would you say that? Why would you say I wouldn't want to do something? You don't even know me. I go, because people who always want to do things, do things. I think what you meant to say is you always want to be no, near, you always want to know how to never be near a situation where you might have to defend yourself. In other words, the true safety component. Yeah. Because what we do is what we're left with is the, uh, you know, going to the range and shooting. That's like practicing getting out of a headlock. Yeah. Like I'm starting, my gun is out, because at most ranges you're not drawing from concealment. Yeah. You know, you're already out. Yeah. And uh, and I always tell people like, hey. And that's what, you know, when I online, I see people go, that's why I carry, that's why I carry. I go, unless you're not the target of the attack at extreme close quarter, you're fucking flinching and pushing away danger. When it's, it's just a, ask any of your EMS paramedic friends when someone goes through a car windshield where there's trauma on their hands. And there's always trauma in their hands and forearms because the startle flinch, you know, gets your hands up in front of your head. Same with knife fights, same with gun fights. There's always trauma in the hands and forearms because the startle flinch overrides all the cognitive. All right. So this is, I mean, this is a, a huge, a huge point. Uh, and, I, and again, I, I, I went down another rabbit hole and off on a, on a micro tangent here in that we look for these objects. Oh, I feel safer and I have an alarm. Uh, you don't always have your alarm on. Uh, most violent crimes are committed by people you know. Most yeah. murders, most rapes, right? Yeah. So where does the alarm there? Like the guy that date rapes you, you were on a date with him. You know, the the sure. office the office worker who comes in and kills you, you're in the office. You're like, you know, so people say to me, no, I don't need to learn to defend myself because I'm I never go out or I'm home. I'm always with my boyfriend or or my husband. I go, so you only have a hundred percent chance of being attacked, right? Yeah. Um, it's like looking at remember what I said earlier, are you a handyman or are you a carpenter or are you an architect? And what I mean by that is like a handyman. He's good with a bunch of tools and he'll jump in there and he'll fix it, but he's not as skilled or as knowledgeable as a carpenter who's got a bunch more training, who is not nearly as situationally aware as the architect, who should be in a perfect world able to just fix that, also build that, but can also design that or look at a building and go, yeah, that building's gonna fall down in 10 years right. because of this structure problem. Yeah. Um, so kind of a, a really, uh, 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 over the top answer to to that but like i never as you probably guessed by now i never give like yes no answers no i like because uh, uh, it makes it made me think you know about kind of like what is my the back surgeries maybe that was it maybe that was a catalyst for me to well, how could like it not anything. be yeah you know right? physically it's like I'm, I'm definitely not where i was before the back surgeries you listen know I mean? you know <laughs> uh uh you know the i mean i i was at the range one day fucking around doing things, outdoor range, nobody was around. I started I started practicing like different stupid, crazy things. Yeah. And I uh, like grabbing the gun, quit, like shit that you would get kicked off the range. And I uh, ended up shooting into the ground about six inches from my foot. I was trying these startle flinch movements and I was experimenting with stuff. I almost shot myself in the foot. That's where the expression came from. But the, uh, that's how old I am. The expression came from that. Um, but when that happened, and the the it was it had rained the day before, and the ground swelled up from the round hitting, and I felt the reverberation near my foot, and then visualized what would happen there. And I was like doing stupid shit. I was like. Uh, pretending I was clearing things and then suddenly realizing, oh, the, the the zombies over here and fucking moving and doing dumb things. And I and I had my finger on the trigger, obviously. That's the only way you could have an AD. Right. Or some people listening to this go, oh, blah, or indeed, right? But right. I was doing, I was, I was pushing the envelope and I, what I was doing was unsafe and I knew it and I almost paid the price. But what I did is I had to sit down for 10 minutes because my, I just went, oh my God, like, holy shit. Uh, but like, I didn't go shooting for a little while after that because I was way in my holy shit zone, unsupervised. It was in my twenties, yeah. you know? What I'm saying is there was a time when I didn't want to be near a gun because, so you might, something might happen in your life where you put the gun away, right? right? And then you start learning about knives or improvised weapon, or then you realize you know, uh, 
I'm getting two fucking dogs. That'll be my alarm system. I don't want the, my, my son's coming over with friends and people and the gun was out. And one day I came in and my gun was moved and his girlfriend was holding the gun. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, and like, and, so, and you went, holy shit. Right. And something happens yeah. where you realize this has to be in a safe all the time, right. but now I don't have direct immediate access to it. I don't want to be walking around with a gun on my holster in the house. Like I'm not living in, you know, and this is all for anyone listening to this. Cause there's probably a lot of people listening to this that always carry their gun. Absolutely. Right. In their house. Right. Yeah. And that's what I mean by like, like it, that's why I was trying to, it was abstract, like vegan versus carnivore. Right. You know, it's like, what, what, what are your actual beliefs around it? Because that's our unconscious bias or our conscious bias. Yeah. What do you think about like, based on your training, do you feel like, it's helped you to be more relaxed in situations where like you can go out in public and be like, I'm ca you're capable of taking care of yourself. You're yeah, like I don't, I don't ever like to be cavalier about this, but, but the truth of the matter is, and I don't know how we are on time. Uh, uh, the, um, you know, I was at a uh, training. I, I have a story for every answer because I believe people will remember the story and I'm a storyteller. So how it makes them feel. And I've been, and I've been teaching for 40 years. So I'm a, really a public speaker, right? Let's hear it. And uh, so I was at this uh, training camp that had a bunch of like a high level guest instructors back in the nineties. And uh, there were, I had done the, my seminar block. And then after the tr training, every instructor had their own table to kind of peddle their wares and talk, get, give more information. And there was a guy beside me and I remember his name, but I'm not gonna mention because it wasn't a cool story and he wasn't cool. Right. Uh, but it's amazing the names I'm remembering right now back then. Right. So, um, and uh, he was a high-ranking Aikido instructor. And I was the only guy at this camp that showed up and taught in a cutoff tank top and shorts. Everyone else was in a gi or some sort of martial art attire. And I wasn't trying to be like, like the rebel. Huh. It was like my school back in the day on the sign on the door, it said no rituals, no uniforms, no nonsense. It was just, it just said, I went, uh, functional self-defense was what I had on the door, functional self-defense. Like, why did I need to think or to even like feel like I, I was obligated to write the word functional? I, cause what I had seen out there was a lot of dysfunctional stuff. Right. That, and this isn't a put down of, of people out there who've mastered their body and mastered their art. Cause a lot of, that's how I develop a lot of haters. Cause they hear it like that. It's just recognizing um, uh, that people start the fight after the fight has already started. And there's so much more to to that, as I've talked about in many examples uh, today. Yep. So, uh, you know, so I'm there. So I do it, I do a lot of talks and depending on the, the crowd, uh, like I had a mom come up to me after one of my, one of my uh, uh, seminars at one of these camps where I'm sitting around with all the other guest instructors and she walks up and she points at me, she goes, you, your message is what's missing in martial arts. And I'm in front of like all the other co-instructors. Well, how did they feel at that point? Probably I was like, it. so let me, let me tell you this. I didn't get invited back <laughs> to these camps after. Yeah. Why? Because like, like who the fucking wants Blower there if a mom's going to come up and go, you're what's missing? As opposed to, that's why like now my whole career is I've, 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 I've evolved in terms of the combative martial art is I only train trainers and I train coaches because I, I only work with conscientious professionals who go, you know, I don't know everything and I don't know everything, but I know what I know. And I know that it's missing. I know that, that the confrontation, like for you to drive from your house to get here, yeah. like D3 is in the room setting up the mics, yeah. right? If you don't know you know, the map to get here, we don't ever do the interview, right? And right. so like people people don't get it. It's like, it's not like I just take him down. Well, no, like he's got two friends coming out of the car, stomping on your head now. That's a beautiful guard. Yeah. I dig it. But that was the wrong move in this multiple assailant fight, right. right? You know? And so, hey, you're a great boxer. I will dig that overhand right. But when he grabbed your M4, and you punched him and broke your hand so you couldn't transition to your pistol, the punch was the wrong move. It didn't matter that you were a better boxer than me. Huh. You didn't understand. You had not Socratically reverse engineered training options that supported you during that scenario. That's what we do. We have a whole formula algorithm. Huh. 
So um, does it make you more comfortable using that formula? Do you think if you if you know yeah it because you because you it, it, once you start to, to to download and deploy the formula, yeah. it's no different than you lying there. You kind of wake up, you don't feel so good, and you start the 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 story of fear, yep. and you're like, oh fuck my back, and then you remember all your mentors, and you go. And you shift to your parasympathetic and you start thinking about the, you look over at your pills, you look over, you, you remember what your Zen master said, you remember if they're, they're all. And so it works in the same way where before you start hyperventilating metaphorically over, fuck, what did I do here? It's like, wait a minute, what's the scenario? What's the primary initiation attack? How much danger am I really in? What's my escape route? What's my improvised weapon? Right. You know, how do I get inside this guy's head? What do I? You know, how do I create, how do I shift psychological gears? What's what's my own personal directive, yeah. right? So, so yeah, there's there's a, a, a ton of stuff. But I was telling this story about this Aikido guy. He says, uh, I'm talking to these women, they come to me, oh, I loved your seminar. And do you really think, because I was doing this two day seminar, two day weekend seminar. Now, if you ask a guy who's been training for 10 years, 20 years, can you learn to defend yourself in two days? They're gonna go, no, absolutely not, it's a bullshit. Uh, bullshit, it's a scam. Because what they're doing is they're unconsciously, through their own bias, comparing where they're at and what they believe they're still learning with the claim. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because you know this a little bit. Can you learn CPR in a day? Yep. Can you learn some simple tactical first aid in a matter of hours? Yes. Does CPR and tactical first aid save lives? Yes. Right, so can you learn to save a life in a day? Yes. Are you a fucking doctor? Nope. Right? And so you can learn to defend yourself in a day. Guess what? You're not a fucking martial artist, black belt. Right? So people go, you know, hey, I've been doing jujitsu for eight years. I still get tapped out. This one day course that Blauer's talking about, it's bullshit. Drives me up a wall because I've been doing it for decades. I teach people about situational awareness, fear management, verbal de-escalation, simple primal gross motor move. I teach them how to get their prefrontal cortex, their cognitive brain, to cultivate a harmonious relationship with their reptilian brain. When you're scared and you flinch and your hands come up and start a flinch, how to use this fucking gross motor, primal gross motor movement, which is incredibly powerful, the strongest thing you can do pound for pound, regardless of gender, the two genders. Did I just get in trouble for that? No, that's, I'm glad Fuck. you said that, thank Fuck. you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then, uh, and then fucking explode because it's a choice is choice right now you don't have time to dial 911 and so i can teach people how to defend themselves in a day but i can't teach them how to box in a day i can't teach them jujitsu in a day i can't teach them wing china in a day i can't teach them taekwondo in a day and so on and so on and so forth right. and so that's the reframe uh that i want people to get if after a one-day seminar someone says like so very often and i've had lots of people use this one-day course or two-day course in crazy situations with one woman who was uh, stabbed and raped by a serial rapist killer it's the fbi's most dangerous predator ends up fighting the guy off she didn't do moves she was lying there cut bleeding knife at her throat getting raped and she told me after she said i remembered what you said at the seminar she said i heard your voice in my head that weapons that are used that typically weapons are used as tools of intimidation that if they're ever used in advance of the attack they will statistically be used again and then she said, oh my God, he's already stabbed me. He's going to try to kill me after he rapes me. Because wow. she was at that point, at knife point, going, this is the day I get raped. She had resigned herself. Then she said, she looked at me and she's crying when she's telling me this. She says, I realized he was going to kill me and I didn't want to die. She said, when I said I didn't want to die, I knew I was going to fight and I went cold with focus. She said, my eyes were closed at that moment and I had my hands over my head. His knife was at my neck. And he's, he's lying on top of me and he's raping me. And I peered, I opened my eyes and peered through my arms. And just as I did that, she says, Tony, he closed his fucking eyes and turned his head. She said, can you believe he closed his eyes right then? Can you believe he made a mistake right when I was ready to fight? I looked at her, I said, Shannon, he made 20 mistakes before that. But until you're ready to fight, you cannot see those mistakes because yep. you're looking at something else. She grabs his fucking, so I don't leave everyone hanging. Yeah. She grabs his arm. So if you're doing a push-up, right? And I grab your arm and I pull it, what happens to you? You fall, fall down. Yeah. So uh, she grabs his arm, jerks the knife away from her throat. He falls down, 
right on right on top of her she sticks her fucking thumb in his eye he lurches back so i teach this move in our weapon control program called clear control counter clear yourself from the trajectory of the weapon in this case the knife move it away secure the arm limb control that she was holding it and then counter so when he had fallen he was right on top of her. she jammed the thumb in his eye and there's this move i teach where you don't what you do is you go in, you go down, and then you go back in because the body moves away from pain. So visualize this. Right. Everyone, if you're driving, don't close your eyes and visualize this. <laughs> but if I jam, if we're in close quarter and I've I got you in some sort of shitty clinch, you're on top of me, and I shove my thumb in your fucking eye as hard as I can, don't give me the, the online macho answer. Well, that was not going to stop me from... What's your body going to do? Because guess what? Physiology bypasses cognition. You're going to pull back for sure. You're going to pull back. As you pull back, if you reach up with the same hand without doing anything and rake that face, like gouge it so your nails, like I, and I teach people to gouge. I go, I want, if you're dead, I want the police to be able to find them easily. You know why? Because there's so much DNA under your fucking nails yeah. that like, they're going to go, oh, let's just find the guy with four fucking, you know, like, ruts in his face from your nail that's how hard you grab because the intensity there we say if you mean to do it make it mean don't fucking hit somebody polite sorry i don't mean to hurt you right <laughs> so you're already now you're already in the fucking danger so now get out of it yeah. so she gouges his eyes rakes his face so the eye the head goes back she claws his face the head goes forward and she snaps an elbow up his eyes are closed he's freaking out so she hits him with all three shots he lurches back Right there, she's on her back, he's on his knees. She lurches back, kicks him in the fucking nuts, fucking kind of you know, shinnies out of that, yeah. jumps to her feet. He's now clawing his face, grabbing his balls. She shin kicks him in the face, but she doesn't do like a tie boxing shin kick. She, and she doesn't do like a bandit like Beckham, like fucking step back. She doesn't do a punt. She just fucking kicks him in the face. Yeah. He lurches back, but he doesn't fall over because his center of gravity is so low. And she stomps him again. She runs home, freaks out, showers, calls her girlfriend, calls the cops. We find out there's a serial rapist killer in Montreal that his MO after the raping was stabbing. One, one girl had died. One was on life support in a hospital. Cops said, had you not fought back, he'd have stabbed you after. Yeah. Now, I, I share that story where, like, like, I didn't teach her technique. She didn't go, I did technique 12. Yeah. It was like, if she had not gotten the fear management situational awareness part together who knows where that had gone yeah so and i forget what we were talking before that triggered that but it was that the story i got to i got to if you guys are listening i got to finish this story if you're still on this call i know some of you ran out of gas <laughs> some of you like are asleep like i don't know how long this podcast has been going um the uh so these li women are listening to me and they're talking and I go, they go, it's really like a two-day seminar? I go, yeah. And this Aikido master beside me he goes, Tony, I have a lot of respect for what you do, but I got to I gotta step in here. Don't take this the wrong way, but you just can't teach someone to defend yourself in two days. I've been training for 20 years. I'm an instructor. I got hundreds of students. You just like, I, I, I love your passion, Mr. Blauer, but you can't teach someone in two days. So I look at him and I'll share his first name. I go, Bob, just because you can't do it doesn't mean I can't do it. So please don't project your limitations on me. Oh, ouch. Right? I was a little yeah. pissed, right? Like, like, don't steal my clients. Right. And it wasn't like about the business. You, you guys yeah. can tell, hopefully, that I'm fucking serious and passionate about this. Yeah. It's not about the money. Yeah. And uh, I go, Bob, let me ask you a question. So he's like, whoa, like, whoa. Like, that was, right? Yeah. Shots fired. I go, uh, I go, Bob. Do you know you can defend yourself? He goes, yeah, I do. But it took me 20 years of training. I go, well, guess what? If something happens to these girls on the next date or when they go to university next year, that's year one. What are they going to do? They just heard an expert say it takes 20 years, but they're getting raped during the first year. Are they going, oh, fuck, looking at their clock going, fuck, in 19 years, I'd have kicked this guy's ass. <laughs> like, what the fuck, Bob? I go, let me ask you another question. He's like looking at me. They're looking at me. I go, if you went outside to pack up your shit and put it, you know, in the trunk of your car. And as you closed your trunk of your car, you were surrounded by three guys. Do you know that you could handle yourself? He goes, yeah. But like I said, 20 years of training. I said, do me a favor, respectfully, ask me the same question. He goes, what? 
I said, ask me if I could defend myself. Same scenario outside. And I'd just done that multiple sale and training where right. I, I went I went through and got my ass kicked by four guys. The guy who created the trail got his ass kicked by four guys. Right. Right? I did the stress inoculation. I did it. And each time I went in there with a positive, okay, I'm going to kick their ass. And it's going to be legendary. People can go, hey, were you there the day the time Blower fucking beat up those four role players? And so what I was trying to always do is create the most realistic fake stuff possible. Right. Synthetic experiences. Yep. And... Uh, and I actually thought when it was four guys, I was going to kick their ass. And it didn't happen, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, it, but what it was, was we, it was back in the day with VHS videos, we video stuff, and we would watch it after yeah. and go, oh, fuck, you know, and nothing ever worked, but you learn, right? That was the AAR. Yeah. And, uh, and then you would try stuff again and do it again. And, and so all of this, so this is in my mind, all of this experience. I go, Bob, ask me if I could defend myself. So he begrudgingly goes, Okay, so uh, you're in your car putting some stuff away. You're surrounded by three guys. Could you defend yourself? I go, you know, Bob, that's something I think about a lot as a professional, as a person who's an options facilitator, who a lot of scared people ask me for advice on their personal safety. I don't want to be cavalier or matter of fact. Yes, you, once you graduate this course, this diploma will scare the bad guy. Just show the bad guy that you graduated from a Blower course, right? Because <laughs> unless the fucker's afraid of the diploma, you still have a problem, right. right? So I look at Bob and I go, Bob, I think about that a lot. And that's how I come up with my drills. I go, well, it's like, the, what's the capability gap? When would all the training fall apart? So here's my answer to you, Bob. I've done multiple sailing drills and I've done some where I'm doing well and I've done some where I got my ass kicked and they taught me a profound deep respect for situational awareness and avoidance, who to hit first, how to let not how to not let math beat you, that if I got three guys around me, who can I hit first and attack the next guy so I do some math and subtract so three on one becomes two on one becomes one on one. I would rather not be in a fight, but one on one is better than three on one. Yeah. And uh, so the real answer, Bob, is I'd like to think that my preparation has been adequate. And so this keeps me humble. I would never say, yes, I can defend myself. I will always say, yes, I will defend myself. Mm. I like it. Fucking heavy shit, man. What did Bob say? <laughs> Bob didn't say much, right? <laughs> yeah. Shut him yeah. down. But this is the whole thing. Listen, I've... I, uh, like I'm telling... You can tell that... Uh, I yeah. mean, hopefully everyone listening to this can can sense the sincerity of my voice okay. um i've gotten a lot better at uh explaining things to people without making them feel small inadequate or stupid yeah. when i was younger you know uh trying to and there's a legendary story about bruce lee where he was uh, uh called up on a uh, talk show in, in hong kong and there, he was there with I think three other kung fu masters, and they were all like you know, and they're much older than him and known for their different styles. But Bruce was the guy who came up with Jeet Kune Do. He was the rebel. He was the new kid on the block, right? Yeah. And so this one instructor, one master comes up. He says, "I have a stance that nobody can push me out of. It's rooted in this and my chi and this and that." And who knows if this is true or not? But this is the urban legend in all the books. He invites the first master to come up and try and destabilize him. The guy puts his hands on him, tries to push him. He can't move him. Goes, hmm, good. Next guy comes up, hmm, good. Bruce comes up, fucking boom, pops him, right? This sound, by the way, it's only one sound that sounds like that. It's skin hitting skin, right? And so he drops the guy, and the guy's on the ground and goes, what, what the hell, man? What did, what did you do that for? He said, because when I fight, I don't push, I punch, huh. right? And this became one of the legends. So Bruce would do things like that where, where, and I remember once, this is in 1980, I was living in California. I'd moved away from home. I was living on the floor, eating one meal a day because I had absolutely, like I was getting 20 bucks a week by some guy who's building the world of Bruce Lee Museum. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was there with my first student and just li literally living on the corner of Hollywood and Vine. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, really shitty area back in 1980 yeah. got a lot of stories from there but that'll be another podcast yeah. uh, and uh but the um i remember 
Fighting Stars magazine came by to do, I was, and they're not in business anymore, but Linda Lee was there, Grace Lee was there, Danny and Asana there, uh, Rex Kimbo, Jeff Amat, all these like legends, people that were in the magazines that I looked up with, looked up to. And uh, I had a chance to do this sidekick demo on an airbag. And the way, and I'm not gonna mention the guy's name who was holding it, the way he was holding it, uh, I knew that if I changed my angle and where he was standing near some furniture with all these people watching, and he was way more famous than me. I was like, nobody. I was the guy that, oh, this is Tony from Canada. He's helping build the museum. But in my heart, when I was 15 years old or younger, my mom, I was sitting on the floor looking at Bruce Lee magazines. And she says, hey, you know, in a couple of years, you got to go to a high school and then you got to start thinking about college. My, my dad, you know, had his own business. He said, you, if you started thinking, you're going to go into the father's business, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a doctor. You know, it's 1975. You were unless you were going to be a vet or uh you, you know do this or like some specific thing you always in, in our family it was like lawyer doctor or family business right and uh i looked up from the bruce lee magazine i'm trying to get the splits i'm on the floor and i said oh mom uh, school is not going to be important for me i don't think i'm going to go she's like i beg your pardon she goes yeah i decided i'm going to be a martial artist like i am actually being polite now i actually said i'm going to be a famous martial artist like Bruce Lee, and I'm going to develop my own self-defense system. She literally pat me on the head and says, okay, dear, we'll talk about this when you're older. Yep. And it was, it was funny. I remember I was, reading that story. What's that? I remember reading that story. Yeah. That magazine article, yeah. So, so I, uh, um, uh, I was just talking here to this week. It's her 80th birthday soon. Oh, nice. And we're, we're, we're uh, uh, planning a big thing down here at the house. And, and she says at the end of the call, she goes, she goes, you know, I still don't know what you do really. <laughs> you know she does but she doesn't right but um what so here i was like at the time i was like 13 or 15 like i knew this was what this was the vision i had yeah. so here i am 20 years old standing in front of all these people reporters here and i want them to go who's that guy so everyone's doing these kicks and i knew what what my sidekick was it was fucking it was a jackhammer oh. and i knew the way the guy was standing that if i if i angled my hips slightly and i hit him this way that he would go back at least three four feet he would hit that chair he would fall into the wall and probably because it's some shitty old Dry. wall yeah. you know, drywall <laughs> that he'd go through it and people would see that yeah. a bunch of other people have been kicking and knocking him back but i knew because i had the way I study angles and I, everything was, was physiology, physics, psychology for me. It wasn't like, I'm going to do a kick. Yeah. It was, how do I fucking nail this guy, but also hit him on the fault line? Yeah. You don't build your, your building on the St. Andrew's fault, right? right? You, if, so I, I look at all the fault lines in the human body. Yeah. Um, and so here I am ready to fucking do this. And I stop and I go, he was a featured presenter today he's in the magazine this is his time and i fucking just did i pulled my kick so he wouldn't look bad so he wouldn't go through the wall right. that's always been my life for decades where where i i, I remember uh i don't know if you know the name june Ree. do you remember that june is one of the most famous he's he's passed away now yeah. but he was like the father of modern Amer american taekwondo right he developed safety chops he saw me in the audience of one of his things one day, and I'd been in the magazines at this point, and he calls me up on stage, oh, the Tony Blauer, very famous uh, reality-based self-defense, come up here, and he's he's in his 60s at the time, and everyone's like looking up to, there's hundreds of people. He asks me to do a demo, and while I'm doing the demo, he asks me to throw a punch at him. You know, I mean, I've I've been in fights, I've sparred, pro boxers, I've trained guys. I'm standing at a distance where I go, I could fucking knock Jun Rhea right now. Just bust his nose, mm. break his teeth, knock him out. I could, I should do that in front of hundreds of people. And he's like, that would be, this is my Bruce Lee moment when yeah. I, I go like, I don't throw punches in the air. I fucking, if I'm gonna throw a punch, it's not a warning shot in the air, I'm fucking shooting you in the face. Yeah. Like it's, and I'm standing there and I go, you can't punch Jun Ri in the face. And so what I do is I telegraph, as I throw the punch, I flex my pec and my lat very overtly so he sees it. Cause I know what he's demoing. Right. Cause he was doing it in the air, talking about his system. Yeah. And and guys, listen, like if you're a Jun Ri fan, this is not to knock him. He was in his sixties, I was 35. Right. But it was that moment where like, I just wanted 
people to see and understand what I was doing, what I'd been every fucking day of my life working on. Yeah. Every day of my life. And there I did as I, I pulled it back. I was like, I'll, I'll just be, I'll just stay back. This isn't my time. For sure. Who would you say, uh, I ask everybody two questions. It's probably just kind of a good segue into that uh, for the first question. If you had one person or one book that you look up to the most, that like inspired you the most to do what it is you're doing today, who would that person be or what would that book be and why? To do what I was doing today would have to be Bruce Lee. Was a, I never met him, but a spiritual guide. I mean, like I saw him and there was ignition. If you read uh, The Talent Code yeah. uh, by Coyle, uh, he talks about neurons and myelinization, but there just to be ignition for somebody to be so enamored with something. So it was it was seeing Bruce move and and his thoughts of to hell with circumstances, I'll make my own circumstances. And all of that really drove me. But I've had all these different like mentors I've never met, whether like Stallone in 1976 with Rocky. Yeah. Like I watched that like 10 times in two months. There was something about the story and his story. Uh, um, but now I've got like other, uh, you know, th there are people in the last few years that have altered how I look at something, right? So the idea, the chance reading of a line in a book or hearing hearing a phrase uh, blows your mind. I was having, a, um, you know, Mike Bledsoe? Mike Bledsoe, so that's okay. super familiar. Yeah, yeah, so uh, he's a provocative uh, 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 coach. Uh, in the originally from the CrossFit community, but in the uh, yeah. you know um, in the fitness leadership yeah. community, yeah. so I've been friends with him for a couple of years. He's had me on a, on a, a couple of his podcasts, yeah. and uh, we were having breakfast one morning, and I was talking about some business problems, and he was saying how we were talking about some lawsuits, and I go, man, I got this thing here. I might have to sue this guy. I fucking hate that shit. Yeah. He goes, oh, I love it. I go, how could you love that? He goes, it means like I'm fucking doing shit. Huh? I'm like, how did you learn that? Because when I think I'm gonna sue somebody, I get nervous and I feel sick and I go, how long is this gonna take? How much money? Yep. And it was somebody had planted the seed in his head that successful business people have lawsuits, right? Right. I'd never learned that. So I'm talking, I go, yeah, like that sort of thing. And like every couple of years, you know, so I'm really old school martial art handshake and I get betrayed by people who yeah. steal my IP and do things and I'm fucking consumed by that. Yeah. He goes, like, like that just happens, man. That's just people. Yeah. And I go, well, you know, it's just hard. I just, I guess, I guess, I don't know, man. I guess I'm just not a good leader. I mean, I'm a visionary. I got these ideas. I mean, look at the, look at my body. I work for 40 years, but I just, maybe I'm just not supposed to be the leader. I'm just supposed to be the, the guy that creates this. He goes, why would you say that? I go, why would I say what? That you're not a good leader. He says, fuck. Like, how long have you been telling yourself that? I go, I don't know, like my whole life. He goes, well, duh. He says, what if, he said, how would things change if you chop, chop, if you just stop saying you're not a good leader? I got goosebumps right now. Yeah. If I think about it too long, I probably start crying. Yeah. Because it was like just a belief. So in, in, our, in our neural circuitry of fear, when we decode and help people understand how to get to know fear, K and W. Part of it is this dissection of the fear loop where we talk about beliefs and beliefs are things you hold to be true. Yeah. And they're, you just you just hold on to that. Where I go, yeah, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna get everyone pumped up, but then they're fucking, they're gonna fall short, they're gonna drop the ball because I'm not a good leader. And so I don't do the next step because I'm, I've adopted the role of deciding I'm not the good leader. So all yeah. of that, the short answer is like, th we'd have, there's too many people oh, that yeah. have inspired me. Yep. But I'll tell this to everybody listening to that. Your mentors can't do the work and you will find mentors and gurus who are really dipshits who have figured out some cool things to say, but then they want a part of your success. Right. I just want to ride your coattails. Yeah. And, and, and another thing I read decades ago, uh, you say you're always trying to teach people. Sorry. You say you're always trying to help people but why do you also keep them helpless? It was a psychologist yeah. uh, who had said that. And it was like, it was those teachers, mentors, gurus who go, you feel better, don't you? Do this breathing, do this thing, take this, take this, you know, uh, uh, essential oil. Yeah. Um, uh, here, you know, wear this, here's a lucky charm. And they go, 
wait till next week when I show you some more secrets. Like they're, they're, right. you're, they're creating a codependent relationship. Yep. I need to, when Shannon, the girl that got stabbed and raped, yeah. when, this is a classic, uh, I heard about it at this restaurant I frequent. She was a, um, an employee, a student, a university student at this restaurant I used to go to a lot. And I come in one day and I had trained their whole staff. There was an armed hold up next door and I knew the owner of the restaurant. And now all these university kids, they want to come into work. They're freaked out. So I can't believe I just remembered his name. Dude, this podcast has been amazing for me. So <laughs> cathartic. Awesome. This guy, Lenny, like the owner, Lenny says, uh, this is like 1986. Yeah. Lenny says, hey, you teach self-defense, don't you? I go, yeah, dude, you know me for like seven years I've been eating here. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know what you do, but I mean, like, would you, they're armed, would you teach, like, what do you teach for guns and stuff? I go, well, I'm gonna teach people that if someone's gonna try and kill them, they gotta try and kill them first. <laughs> like, yeah. it's not a secret move, yeah. right? Get, <laughs> stay away from the little hole, right. um, uh, uh, fight. And so um, he goes, can I, can you do a seminar? I'm gonna pay for it for my whole staff. So we set up these, uh, two seminars for them. Shannon was in one of them. We all she had is a weekend seminar. Yeah. So I come in a few months uh, later. This uh, uh, one of the one of the waiters comes up to me. His name's Alistair. He comes up to me. Goes and I'm sitting down looking at the menu. He leans into the table. He goes, "Did you hear what happened to Shannon?" It's just the tone and the sentence that you say to a self defense instructor. Like literally, like I think I held my breath. I think my heart stopped for a second. Oh yeah. And I and I go know what he goes she was stabbed and raped and he looks at me and he goes like it's crazy she fought back and she got away from the guy and i'm like i'm holding the menu i let go of the menu and he's leaning on the table if you can picture this, he's leaning on the table saying it kind of like in hushed urgent tones so none of the other patrons can hear right. and i lean in and i reach up and i grab him by the fucking back of the head because he's leaning at me and i pull his head in, I go, asshole, say that first next time. Say, Shannon is okay, and then continue with the story. <laughs> right. Shannon got stabbed and raped, pause, but she's okay. <laughs> like, fuck, like literally yeah. my heart stopped. Uh. <laughs> and uh, I go, holy fuck, like, he, I go, what happened? She said, I don't know the whole story, but, and he says, and this is significant for people, I think so, he goes, um, but you know, this happened like two weeks ago. She came in last week, back to work she's got a, like a bandage on her chest where she was stabbed and she's like in this good mood like kind of like upbeat empowered yeah and and he doesn't say that he goes like like it's a little weird i mean she's like like she seems like it, she's acting like it didn't happen so i go well al when you were stabbed and raped what did you do the week after and he goes <laughs> what i said the last time you were stabbed and raped you're a guy so it would have to be sodomized but when you were stabbed and sodomized what did you do the week after he goes, that's never happened to me. And then I said, then shut the fuck up. Maybe she's happy she's not dead, yeah. right? And that she fought off this predator. Yeah. And it, was, it took another week before I could connect with her. I come in, I find out her shift. I come in, she's there talking to her mom who lived in Ottawa and had driven into town. I walk over, they're crying. She says, uh, mom, this is the man that saved my life. Mm. And I say, Shannon, I wasn't there, I didn't do anything. You saved your own life. She goes, yeah, but I did what you taught me. I go, well, I don't know what happened, but like, I wasn't there. You did this by yourself. You know, like, do you have a minute? Can you, like, she pulls me aside. The whole time she's holding my hand, she's crying. She tells me the story I told everybody listening. Yep. And and uh, she says a couple times after, she says, I heard your voice in my head and I, I did what you said. I said, no, you didn't. You did what you said you decided to fight. And uh, she says, yeah, but if I hadn't gone to the seminar, I didn't tell you to come to the seminar. But if I had, no, no. There's lots of people that are really good at shit that don't do things. Right. They hesitate, they freeze. Because, because we haven't changed their relationship with fear in a suitable way before the, before the incident. Um, and, and I'll share this with you guys. I didn't share it with her, but a couple of times she said, thank you, thank you. I said, don't thank me. And the reason I did that, I did, when in our trainer development course, we tell the story in deep detail because I say, why didn't I do a fist pump in the air? Why didn't I high five her? 
why didn't I hug her and say, remember what started this conversation again was that psychologist expression. You tell, you say you're always trying to help people, but why is it you always keep them helpless? How subtle and deep is that? I knew that if I said to her, remember these skills are perishable, that I just fucked her for her next confrontation. Absolutely. God forbid that happened. I went out of my car. I'm not embarrassed to say this. I started crying, fucking yelled really loud because I was so, listen, if I teach you some of this stuff, you've been in the military, you've been in law enforcement. No, okay. I was a law enforcement in the military. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you've been in fights, you've seen fights, you've been in pain, you've overcome adversity, you've you've fought through shit, you train, you've done martial arts. If I teach you some of our spear system and our stuff, I expect you to fight because I look at your backstory. Right. Shanna was 180 pounds, five foot eight woman with no backstory. Right. She was not supposed to win that fight. And she didn't do any, she didn't even do the spear, right? Yeah. So people go like, oh, Blower thinks the spear. It's not the spear. It's the fucking experience, not the spear. It's the experience of going going through the training where at the end of it, and I've had lots of people at the end of it, one day or two day course, four day course, say, I'm not happy with my, but look how specific this is. They don't go, I don't think I'd fight. Everyone who finishes our, corning, our, our training will look in the mirror and go, I'll do what I can to protect my family. But then they'll have very specific things like, I wasn't happy with my aggression during those force on force drills. How can I cultivate that? I was afraid when I fell to the ground. And then I'll say, hey, I need you to go to my friend's Gracie school. I need you to go to uh, uh, um, you know, 760, the Jiu Jitsu school near, near my, my place. Oh, you're striking. I need you to go to, go to CSA sports, like uh, my buddy Kirian. Those guys will teach you some shin kicks and knees. Like all, if somebody, but I don't want people to confuse combat sports and martial arts. If someone specifically say, I'm afraid of getting hit in the face, I'll go find a good coach who will spar with you so that you overcome this, this fear reflex of getting struck in the face, who can do it in a way that it's not gonna create some sort of PTSD because someone just beats the shit out of you because you're the new meat in the gym, right? Right. And then if the question is, yeah, but it's okay, I feel like I'm sparring my coach, I'm afraid to spar other people, okay, now you need to, in a small group setting, slowly get into that until you go, you know, okay, I can do it. And this is no different than what I, talked about Sean saying, I can fight 10 rounds in, in the gym. I don't know if I can do four rounds. You find a psychological way to attack right. the perceived problem, the operative word perceived. Yeah, I think that's the whole lion and gazelle uh, analogy that, that my buddy uses. That's uh, my buddy Phoenix and I were talking about. And I was like, I think the difference is, is that my buddy that refers himself as a gazelle, he's worried about getting a tooth knocked out or whatever. Right. Where Phoenix and I, I'm okay with losing a tooth. I'm okay with getting hit in the face. Right. It's okay. You know what I mean? Like I, I, and it's, it's not. It's, I, I, agree, I agree with that. But like if I were here with them, yep. uh, I, I would want to spiritually shift it out of the, you know, like I, I was like, like uh, you know, I make a joke that, you know, that if you get like, like cut or a bullet wound or a busted nose, that you could maybe get hero sex if the story to support <laughs> how that happened, right? So it's like, That's fuck, yeah, let's do that, hero sex, right? Um, so again, it's it's different upbringing and background. Right. Uh, the, it's the psychology, I'll give you a great example. Are you into CrossFit? And I was, yeah, until my back got all jacked, okay. yeah, for sure. So a lot of people, especially women, hate box jumps. Yeah. And so one day I'll write a book or a little treatise called Cheering Isn't Coaching. Right, because yeah. that's what it is. It's like, oh, I don't care if I get in a fight. No, no, no. Like it's deeper than that. We could peel the onion. It's way deeper than that. Well, like, what does it mean to you to be a protector? Does it? At the end of that conversation, you'd go, if I lose this fight, I might never see my son again. Right. And you go, oh fuck, that's why I train. It's not for hero sex. Yeah. And your friend who doesn't want to lose a tooth, it's not that. It's because he's afraid to die. Yeah. Right. And right. we, we don't want to talk that deeply or that honestly. Yeah. So <coughs> um, I was about to give you this really cool metaphor, and I just forgot the story just before that. Um, fuck it, it's there's been good. too many. 
So the uh, the next question I'm going to ask you that I ask everyone else is uh, did I did I not even answer that that question? No, I you did. did. Bruce Lee was your the person that inspired you the most, but along the way you had many mentors, you know. And yeah, and 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 know. so many good books. Yeah, yeah for so sure. many good books. Yeah. Um, the next question is: If you had one thing in your life that you could point to, that it could be business related, uh, life, uh, you know, it could be in the martial arts world or whatever. Um, I was like your biggest regret, I guess. You know that you could save somebody else the heartache and be like, you know what? If I could go back and redo it that way, or reframe my mindset for that time in my life to maybe shift the path that I ended up going down, what would that be and why? Fuck, man. You know, uh, can I name drop another podcast? Absolutely. So Marcus Luttrell and his crew had me on. Yeah. The team never quit, yeah. and uh, what an honor to be on that. It was the first time I talked about. Uh, um, a home invasion and a business invasion that had happened to me uh, a month apart. I wasn't home, we had a home invasion. Uh, I brought my wife on a show called, uh, oh shit, uh, I forget the name of it. We'll put it in the show notes, I'll get it to you, because it's it's really important yeah. for people to listen to that. For sure. Uh, but I wasn't home and, and three guys hit the house, two, two guys armed, no masks, my wife and kids home. Mm. They got out of it fine, we're all good, they're in jail, they're just starting to get out of jail now. Uh, this happened back in 2009. And um, the I talk about that on on the team never quit, and they ask uh, like a similar question, and uh, they don't word it the way you do, but it came out where right. we can look at regrets, and I'll tell you what, you know, I can look at the I've been in pain for thirty six years, neck pain. I got kicked in the head teaching a private class in nineteen eighty six. I remember the day. Yeah. Got kicked in the head. I woke up the next day with neck pain. I've had neck pain every single day since 19, uh, about three weeks ago. I had some work done here at my friends over at Human Garage in, in Venice. Yeah. And uh, this, and they've been working on me for like over a year, as well, as well as another pit crew. I got people down in Encinitas. I go here. And they did something. And, and actually, I'm going to say, ex like, ex like almost like an archaeologist explored onto something. The chronic deep, deep, deep neck pain is gone, hasn't come back in three weeks. Oh, wow. So now I got new pains coming up because every layer oh, yeah. is like, right, oh, oh, that was suppressed because this was more acute. You didn't feel this other pain. Yep. But I emotionally, psychologically go, that pain. And I get up every morning, I go, is it there? It's not there. Fuck me. Holy shit. Like it's a good day. Oh, wait a minute. I got this. Right. So it's almost like you took the splinter out and now you notice the, the, the rock in your shoe. Yep. But the other thing was hurting more. So uh, I could say, because I've had neck pain for 36 years, that is that is that set up a condition on my neck that uh, uh, triggered a nerve damage during a massage that that uh, killed my facial nerve and trigeminal nerve that uh, created par paralysis one day. For, like for three months, I was like drooling, like uh, my face was like like uh, frozen, like from a dentist. Yeah. Uh, where like I, I was like, my whole life is teaching where I couldn't talk. So I'm sitting there going, what if I can never teach again? Yeah. Like you talk about depression, anxiety. Yeah. I mean, it, just, it was like, it, like literally within a day, somebody just took everything that I love the most and next to my family away uh it's been a year of like nerve regeneration doesn't happen very quickly it wasn't bell's palsy it was well that's that's the, uh, the so there's two types of bell's palsy one is um uh uh the virus yeah. they, they don't know anything about it they just say it's a virus and one is structural okay. mine was structural um i i don't like the name bell's palsy okay. i have a negative connotation to it because fair enough because, but i talk about it yeah they called it bell's palsy okay. but the doctor after the cat scan asked me this isn't conventional. He says, he says to me, he doesn't know what to do. He says, have you ever been hit in the head? So I, when I finished laughing, I said like for 30 years. Yeah. And then I talked about this and, and, and I explained how, like I knew when it happened. Yeah. I, was, I was getting some, some neck, uh, some body work done. And this massage therapist turned my head too far when I wasn't relaxed. And I felt a hot, it felt like jello being squished in my neck hot jello, like a sensation I'd never felt. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, that was not good. I mean, I felt all sorts. I've had torn bone lining, broken ribs, broken hands, broken knuckles, broken nose, chipped teeth, yeah. fucking, you know, bone bruises, all sorts of shit yeah. that where I've gone to the hospital and went, okay, this is broken. They go, no, it's not. You just got that. Okay. Wow. But like this was there and I was like, whoa. And a week later, I woke up and my whole left side of my face was completely numb. Yeah. 
went to the hospital because it's a precursor to a stroke. Right. I didn't even remember that. They're like, do you have any pain down your arm? I got, I always got pain in my arm. This finger's numb. This is like in CAT scan. The guy says, you got Bell's palsy. Oh, what the fuck's Bell's palsy? I go, I don't like, I don't have an, uh, like, uh, 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 they can say you can get it from like a cold wind in your ear can trigger it. Uh, uh, but basically if you do the research, it's like nobody knows what the fuck it is and how exactly. it started. I just had a friend that had it. That's how I knew what it, which, yeah. what it was. So same thing, you know, the face started drooping. She was like, what the hell? You know, she just right. had a baby. And and she it, healed? Yeah, yeah, she, uh, yeah. It went back to normal. Good, good for her. It's, yeah. uh, um, it's, uh, it's a crazy thing. So I could say, listen, it was the most humbling thing. It taught me, it triggered anxiety. I started having panic attacks, which led me to my buddy, Brian McKenzie, who, gave me some breathing protocols that within four days stopped that anxiety and panic attack. Uh, and I didn't know where it'd be coming from. All of a sudden I'd be driving, all of a sudden I'd, I have to pull over and get out of the car. Oh yeah. Um, uh, crazy shit for like somebody like like me. I mean, like this is, so I'm 58 now, it's happened, I was 57. So for 57 years, I never had that, all of a sudden like that. But it's because the SNS, my sympathetic nervous system was just on fire. The All the nerves in my face and how close is that nerve innervation to your spine, to your neck. I mean, the injury was through my, through my neck. Yeah. So it was, it was just insane. But through that, it taught me, okay, you're working way too hard. Your pace is too hard. You give so much more of yourself to people who don't give a shit. I'm like a concierge online, people asking me fucking stupid questions. Hey, are you doing a course here? Oh, apparently you're not on a smartphone that has Google and you don't know how to find our website and our calendar, let me answer for you, <laughs> you know? And so I'm answering people who don't even, like some people say, thank you very much, Mr. Blower, I get a lot of private messages. Yeah. Hey, thank you for your, you know, everything you've done to help make us safer. This, I do get a lot of the thank yous, yeah. but there's a lot of people who just think, you know, and, and they're not malicious, some of them. They're just, they're just used to this like entitlement generation that just says i'll just ask a question online yep. um and it, what so what you know having the facial paralysis taught me about the importance of deliberate breathing i got exposed to uh, uh several breathing experts so i created different modalities at work okay. that led me to human garage that took away the pain from my that wouldn't have happened so i could say i wish i never had bell's palsy yeah right yeah. um you couldn't be doing what you did if you didn't have your last operation Absolutely where you said, right. fuck this. Yep. So you could say, I wish I never fucked up my back. I could say, I wish I was born now because then I'd have understood how to use a foam roller and fucking, you know, elect, uh, lacrosse balls and I wouldn't have all this pain in my body. Yep. But then I wouldn't have developed the system I did. And I have, I know for a fact, I've literally impacted lives. I've helped make people safer. Absolutely. You know, how do you, you know, how do you do it? Who likes pain? Nobody does, right? Yep. So, um, so why I brought up the Latrell thing and everything is it came out where, where you know, in 2010, my COO did a deal behind my back and pretty much stole my company from me. I went from a $12 million uh, uh, a year company making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as my salary on a Friday to a Monday to zero. Mm. I had at the same time three trainers that I met uh, most people know who they are. I'm not going to mention their name for yeah. whatever reasons. I've written about them in my Facebook notes by name. Right. Um, but all three of them thought I was going to just either kill myself or be in jail because uh, I was going to go kill somebody or or I was just going to go away or move back to Canada or just... And I reinvented the company. It took five years, but they all went off that first year. One made a copy of my high gear uh, they all started to support it and they broke off and started telling people, calling my clients without, you know, it was, it was a fucking shit show yeah, of sure. betrayal. Um, and some of these people I had like, I had truly mentored, I'd lent money to, I'd helped them out, you know? And I was like, you're doing what? You've invented your own system based on my research? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. Right? None of them said, do you need any help? Can I help you move? <laughs> Can I lend you some money? Can I, here's a hand. Um, so people go, that was like, in terms of business, that was the darkest time of my life where I'm sitting at home. We had just had a home invasion. My wife's crying on the floor. I'm speaking at this counterterrorism conference in San Diego. It's just 2010. My main product has been taken from me. I have no revenue. I'm already booked for this thing. Tickets are paid for. I've always wanted to live in California. Yeah, I'm 50 years old. My wife's crying going, we just had our green cards. What are we doing? Are we moving back to Canada? What's happening? And I look at her and the kids 
and I say, book tickets for everybody. Let's go find a house and move to California. Not what she expected me to say, right? right? She's like, what? I said, I heard the weather in San Diego is near perfect. So if we're going to be homeless, let's be homeless in San Diego. She starts to cry laugh, right? right. You know, she, I go, hey, listen, well, I dissolved the company. We had uh, about 400,000 bucks from after dissolving everything. Yeah. I said, we're going to go in. I'm going to uh, uh, put, uh, put a down payment on a house and reinvent the company. And uh, she said, don't buy a house. Let's just live in an apartment. Let's live in a trailer house. I don't give a shit. I'm here for you. Just, I said, good woman. I said, yeah. I said, no, no, we're not, we're not doing that. I know what I have to do. I said, I know why this happened. I trusted people. I was betrayed. I chose not to, to uh, 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 use the system I teach people. I talk a lot about situation awareness and pre-contact use. And I always, the people that fucked me, there were three or four trainers. Yeah. I always had problems with them for years. I've had conversations with them going, hey, when it's time for you to move on, let's do it with dignity and respect so you're not afraid to see me on the street. I'll even write a letter of referral to help you kickstart your business, but don't ever fuck me. Because yeah. that had happened to me back in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, so there were times where I could see it and I went, let's have this adjustment conversation. So uh, so I, if I whiteboarded the pre-contact indicators, I go, yep, yep, yep. But I, I said, there's no way they would do this. I'm too important component to Blower Tactical Systems. It's my name, right? right. Um, and and so I was embarrassed by that, which made me even I more, when I rationalized it and figured out what the strategy was, a more fierce warrior, fuck this shit, okay, here we go. And, uh, um, and I said to her, no, we're gonna buy a house, because even though you know what happened, your life is going to continue as if you didn't know that it happened because this is my fucking fault and I'm going to fix it. Okay. And uh, so I rebuilt the thing, the, the company. Uh, we're busier than ever now. But, you know, so I've been asked that type of question before, like, uh, what do you regret or what would you fix or what was the hardest thing you went through? And I realized that's the tapestry. Those are our scars. So if I go, dude, what's that scar in your knee? And you go, oh, that's when I tried to do this move over a fucking ramp, I'm a skateboarder. I go, well, that fucked up your leg and you're in operation and you missed three months. And you go, and I go, ooh, don't you wish you could take that back? No, because then I wouldn't have the balls to get back on the skateboard and do this again. Sure. So earn your scars, and, but not just earn them in a cavalier way, uh, respect and have some reverence for your scars. Yeah, and, and learn from them. You know, For me, that's been my biggest, uh my biggest journey lately, especially, you know, my buddy uses the analogy of, uh, I think it's like an old Native American deal, right? Where the, the Indian brings in the frozen snake out of the snow and, you know, he thaws him out, you know, because he doesn't want him to die. He thaws him out and the snake bites him, you know, and he's going to die. It's a poisonous snake. And he says, dude, why'd you bite me? Dude, I took you out from the cold, you know, and I took care of you. And he's like, you know, I was a fucking snake. Right. You know, and that's kind of the deal is that you, you have people around you and things around you and just trust your intuition i mean that's what i'm doing you know I'm, I, yeah. I don't titles it's, don't it, mean much to me yeah you know? it's more about like the feeling and, and the sense of loyalty that you have with certain people yeah and it's so hard because uh you know it it was you know this will date me but iggy pop said yeah. Yeah. imagine if desperation were attractive what a heavy line right, right. so there's different phases in our life where like if 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 we think that we want to get laid like when we're guys and we're young but what we're really trying to do is find somebody that can tame us that we can fall in love with that we can raise a family with but we don't understand that because we don't have self-awareness at that time totally. so because we're desperate we gatling gun this right <laughs> right right yeah yeah for sure. so so in each phase of our lives you know i, I like i'm i'm I think a lot, I write a lot. And so the magic of smartphones, I text my kids a lot and I share with them like things, these realizations that I'm having that I wish somebody had said to me when I was 20. And I, I got, you know, kid that's 16, 21, 28, turning yeah. 28. And I always start, I go, listen, you probably think I'm like, okay, dad, yeah, here's another fucking, <laughs> you know, uh, sentimental, you know, poem or cut. Like, but I go, listen, please. If I'm just planting seeds, that's the best I can hope for. But try to think about this. Because if someone could convince me 
to think about these things that I'm realizing now, my life would have been, I still would have, I think, achieved the things I did, but with less pain. Yeah. One of the things that I understand now, and this is one of the big drivers and one of my big whys, if for lack of a better expression, uh, is, and that's used, like everyone's like, what's your why? What's your why, right? Uh, yeah. Simon S uh, Sinek yeah. uh, uh, made that famous. And not to steal his thunder, because he's way smarter than me, and he wrote the book on that. <laughs> but in 1986, 1986, this is way pre all that, if you can find it inside Karate Magazine, there's a feature spread on my system, and the title is A Word to the Wise. But wise is not spelled like you spelled it in your head. Right. It's a word to the W-H-Y-S. This is why we train this way. Yeah. So I've always had that, why. like, let's do this, why? Because well, uh, you want to, or because this is important, right? right? And so uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty neat, but I text the kids all the time, and I go, please, 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 like try to screenshot this, save this, because at some point you're gonna go, fuck. Yep. Because what that can do is it can accelerate the learning curve. Oh, for and, sure. and, and and life and experience and wisdom requires time in. You need to do reps and you need to make yeah. mistakes. I spent a lot of time talking to my, I, my grandma raised me, so I spent a lot of time talking to my grandma who was uh, considerably older than me. And then my wife's grandma is in her 90s. You know, I spent a lot of time talking to her. And a lot of it is just trying to gain some of that wisdom, you know, because obviously she's lived a lot longer than I have. And there's some some things that she definitely knows that I don't. Right. And if I could learn from her, then why wouldn't I? Right know? on. Um, so I think it's pretty awesome. What's the, uh, the best way for people to connect with you and get in touch with you? Um, I probably, I would say if you want it, if you want uh, political posts and pictures of my food, Instagram, <laughs> I don't post pictures of my food anymore. Good thing right. that that phase of life is gone, right? right. It was like, remember that? Yeah, when yeah everyone's, everyone's posting, posting food. food. Uh, I am quite active on Instagram and I've got a bunch of Facebook accounts, but if they want to like, like, like we do stuff for corporations and military and law enforcement and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, all of that information, if you go to, uh, Blauer, my last name, B L A U E R, Spear. That's our self defense combative system, Spear, S P E A R. So, one word, blauerspear.com forward slash start is an insanely busy page that has every link that you could possibly want from our No Fear podcast to uh, online training to how to book a seminar to free reading, free content. Yeah. So, and I'm uh, Tony Blauer on, on Facebook. And we've got, you know, equipment and, tactical sites and stuff like that. But if you get there, you'll, uh, there's links to all the other shit. Cool, and you don't do any, um, well you do, do you do family like training stuff like that, you do corporate stuff and you say you train trainers and yeah. coaches. Yeah, so my, but... my, my main thing now is, so when I was 20, I was asked what I wanna do. And I told this venture capitalist at the time, I wanna make the world safer. And he kind of cocked his head like the RCA dog head. Right. And he went, you wanna make the world safer? How are you gonna do that? And I said, I like, I, I I believe that self-defense taught incorrectly and I, and I have this vision of how it's gotta be based on physiology, physical psychology, it's gotta be based on scenarios and teach people to think about their safety, not about techniques. Yeah. Don't confuse technical with tactical is the expression. I, and so uh, he says, you don't think that's a little grandiose? And I said, like grandiose, like why would making the world safer be grandiose? Like in my mind, like, like that's, like when I say it now and I think about it, that sounds pretty big. Yeah, it's just the world, just all the people in the world. Um, but uh, so that's been my my driving uh, component since then, and uh, um, and I forget why why I kicked off on that because I was asking about like with family stuff when you have oh, like, yeah, families yeah. coming. In. So what I realized is is if I thank you uh, if I so it happens when you get old you just kind of lose where you were <laughs> if. Um, if I was still just running a school, yeah. then I could only teach 50 or 100 or 500 people, right. right? But if I've got you know one more instructor, maybe we could do a thousand people. So right now, what I do is I try to find professional conscientious instructors who wanna make a difference. We've got close to 200 affiliates all over the world yeah. in almost every single country. We've taught thousands. My main work is training still uh, uh, active duty. Right. So it's law enforcement, military. So we've got thousands of those because that's our main business, but that's not a commercial thing. You can't go get a class with these guys. It's for their unit or their organization. Right. Um, but I do have, more and more, and it's exciting. Uh, we had some uh, cool guy, I'm not gonna mention his name for privacy purposes, but his, right. name, his first name is John, who contacted me, former Marine, uh, and some things that happened too close to home, right. 
uh, literally not too close to his house geographically, but like with his family, yeah. where uh, he had heard about me uh, through my buddy Brian Callen, and and uh, I want to name drop there if anyone knows him because Brian's such a fucking funny guy who's right. also into self defense and martial arts. But um, uh, the uh, so he did something. He set up a private course for his wife, his two sons, his daughter, and her husband. Uh, and I brought in three of my trainers. We put them in gear. We did scenarios. We ran them through stuff. So this is like this private, like how cool was that? Yeah. But that's a serious dad, right? Yeah. No no offense if other dads don't decide to do that. Right. It's, and this comes back to like the gun thing on the night table. Right. Like at some point you go, well, I'm going to learn how to use a gun. I'm going to keep it on the night table. I mean, I, I think about it because, like, for me, like, I travel, you know, with my podcast and stuff like that. I'm going all over the country right. doing podcasts, and I know my wife would feel more comfortable if she was. Uh, I mean, I know I would feel more right. comfortable sure. if she was a little bit more dialed in if I, when I'm gone, you know. Um, so shooting is definitely one of those things that we're going to be l- looking uh, right. at getting her trained up on, and then you know, some kind of self defense. So where would you steer? Her? What direction would you steer us? Certainly not my company. Oh, be, it's on. horrible. To, um, <laughs> the, uh, well, what I'll do is just, just because we've become friends is, okay. is I will uh, get her access to our online. I've, I, what I did is I recorded a 90 minute, just a presentation on fear, understanding fear, okay. nothing to do with active self defense. Okay. Uh, it's called no fear and it's an online course. So I'll get her that course and you guys can listen to it because awesome. it just starts there. Cause at the end of the day, like for example, my wife isn't allowed, she has a gun, but she's not allowed to get a, a, a permit and carry. I mean, we live in California, that'd be near impossible. But right. because uh, she would just shoot people randomly because <laughs> like she's, she's, if you follow her Instagram, oh, you'd, yeah, understand, yeah, so you'd understand what I mean. Like yeah. I go, like, you're not allowed to have weapons. Right. Like, why, damn it? Look how that fucker parked. Put, like, put that gun away. You know, like, um, just kidding. That's just hilarious. kidding, folks. But. You know, so what I'm saying is it starts with that. Yeah. It's like, so so if she can look at fear, because saying go do this 12-week self-defense course or go do jiu-jitsu or go do boxing, yeah. she might do it, but she's doing it for you. But inside, she's like, I'll never fucking do this. Yeah. You know, so my my first thing, I always tell people that that if you can create the homeostasis with respect to your own internal dialogue, for sure, then you create a, a level of honesty and truth. Yeah. And now you can go, what about this? Yeah, she thinks through osmosis or whatever that she's be uh, adopting some of my beliefs about home security and things like this. So, you know, lately that when I've been traveling, she's like, I never panicked before. I've never been panicked. You know, right. I'll hear a noise and it's like the kids are upstairs and I'm like, oh, my husband's not home. And, you know, right. she starts freaking out. It's new for her. So, right. Um, you know, some of that, I, I uh, all of that is. Well, a couple of things. I mean, this, the, like, I'll get you some information that might help. Yeah. And there, listen, there's some people, listen, I I can read a book or even a quote and suddenly I've got a year of content that I'm thinking about, right? Right. But my brain's already at a certain point. It's at a tipping point where suddenly that kind of like unleashes a whole bunch of ideas. Um, she may read something and go, got it, I'm yeah. good. She might read something and go, okay, now I don't have, now I know what to do with the fear spike. It's almost like the person who doesn't know how to catch their breath. So you trick them with the bag, right? You know, the bag doesn't stop, doesn't create proper diaphragmatic breathing, right. but it tricks you to focus on something else, yep. right? And so so sometimes you can look at something and she can go, okay, now here's what I wanna know, right? Do you guys have a dog? Uh, we do not. Okay, so like, like most opportunistic shit, that's never gonna happen if you got one or two dogs. Right. And if they sound at a certain volume. Here's another one you like, you know, uh, you know, get lights with timers on. Go out, if, uh, find somebody who's got size fucking forty feet, and and buy a couple of running shoes and boots from them and leave them outside your house. Right. I've had people do this oh. where they've had some issues where, like, because somebody who's like sneaking opportunistic goes, "Holy fuck, how big is this guy in the house?" Right. Yeah. Most most people don't don't want to get caught or they don't get hurt. Right, and so there's there's things that are, can create deterrence, but dogs are amazing, uh, uh, you, you know, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if somebody bypasses all that shit, it's up to you, yep. uh, and you want her to feel protected. But I can tell you this from having lots of kids, women, even men in my class who are there for the, they're not there for the wrong reasons. Right. They're not ready to learn Got because it. they're psychologically like in some sort of fear loop. 
Got it. Right. And so that's the area you want to clear first. And then, and then what, you know, what we can do is, you know, I've got a ton of instructors and depending on where it is or when it is, like when the family came to my house, I, I mostly focus on training my trainers. I don't do a lot of private instructors. It's got to be either somebody really famous whose autograph I want. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and so, uh, or, uh, I'm just joking, but I'm half serious or, or or it's like a like a some sort of vip thing so there's certain contracts that i don't send my team to because of who the organization is absolutely um but what i did was uh so i've got a, a three-car garage that's all the gym yeah we set up they 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 drove down they lived in california at the time this family uh, they drove down got a hotel we did it at my house so I came and did parts and met them and talked to them and talked to them individually. But I brought in three of my trainers from out of town and had them run them through the intensive stuff, yeah. but because it was local. So in the case of specifically with your wife for selfish reasons, screw everybody listening to this, is one of the things that we can do is maybe get some like-minded families together, yeah. get a small group together, and then I can send a trainer there or maybe you guys come to my place, we'll figure it out. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I got a gym set up in my garage too. So either way, we go yeah. there. I prefer to go to yours for obvious reasons. Beautiful, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you know. Might have more more cool stuff, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But thanks again, Tony, for coming on, man. I, I really appreciate it. And it was a pleasure meeting you and uh, hearing your story. And I know it's gonna resonate with a lot of people and uh, I'm excited to, to hear the feedback from people. So um, if there's anything that I could ever do for you, feel free to reach out. I'll be uh, releasing this podcast next week for everybody to listen. So nice. Thanks again, nice. man. I no, this this was this was great, and it was very different than most of my other podcasts. Mostly because of the evolution that happens with all of us. Yeah. But but honestly, uh, your energy and your backstory, both literal and figurative, right. creates like a a different connection. Yeah. And and that uh, you know if you were just a gun guy or a knife guy or a, this had been a talk about you know techniques and training right I think this is uh, uh, you know the mind navigates the body For and sure. and that that has to happen first so this is uh, supersedes that in the end of the day. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, man. I have a good day. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.